groups representing passengers, airports, and on and on. The House produced legislation, the House produced legislation makes transformative changes in the passenger experience and in private aviation. It provides innovators of the unmanned aerial systems and advanced air mobility space the regulatory certainty they need to deploy some of the most advanced technologies we've seen in aviation. We also make meaningful reforms to expedite agency process, processes and position the agency to manage the ever-expanding aviation system, and the bill contains numerous provisions aimed at improving aviation safety. With all the recent incidents, accidents, near misses, and problems, it's nothing short of malpractice that the Senate hasn't bothered to even mark up the FAA reauthorization bill. The Senate's repeated failure has destroyed $650 million in airport investments this year alone and, <clears throat> and delayed enactment of urgently needed safety measures and reforms. There's never been a worse time to leave the FAA unauthorized, yet that's where the Senate's inaction has left us. You're doing the best that you can with the job you have, Mr. Administrator, but it's clear to me the Senate's inability to do its job has real-world consequences that directly affect American leadership in aviation and in the safety of the traveling public. We stand ready, willing, and able to negotiate the FAA reauthorization bill when the Senate is ready. Hopefully you can do something <clears throat> to help us with that, Mr. Administrator, and hopefully the conversation we have today serves to underscore the urgency of getting a long-term comprehensive reauthorization bill signed into law. Ready to go? I now recognize Ranking Member Cohen for five minutes for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to say I disagree with everything he said, that we need to fund Ukraine and Israel at the same time. I'm just glad you're here to listen to it. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and thank you, Mr. Whitaker, for coming before us today. It's such an important time with the aviation and, and you're being at FAA. We appreciate that. Uh, it's important that we have leadership. That's the thing I heard most from people in the industry over the last six, seven, eight months was we need a strong administrator and we need an administrator. And I think everybody's pleased with your selection. But we've had the recent problems, it's obviously not your fault, with Boeing, uh, the 737 MAX 9. We had the Japanese airline collision, uh, and the increase in runway incursions have, which have been around for a while. And I know that that's a, a, on the top of your mind is getting something straightened out with those potential intersections of airlines at, on, with the FAA and getting better con air traffic controllers or more air traffic controllers, really, more, and uh, we need to get a pipeline going to get more of, of everybody to give an opportunity to participate. The FAA's prompt response to the January 5 Jan Boeing incident is commendable. Temporary grounding of more than 170 aircraft, the audit of Boeing and what you've done there has been, uh, I think everybody agrees with and, and, and appreciates. Boeing must be held accountable because, as you've said and others have said, safety's first, and, and that's, doesn't, that needs to be made clear. Uh, as this incident and the MAX 8 crashes demonstrate, complacency is a luxury we cannot afford when it comes to aviation safety. Boeing and the FAA's oversight must make necessary changes to ensure similar incidents and accidents don't happen again, with doors flying off in the middle of the air or planes falling out of the sky or whatever. Uh, as the FAA and the NTSB investigations into this incident accident unfold, our subcommittee will stand ready to work with you and all the relevant parties to enact legislative changes that are necessary. But of course, the first thing we need to do is get the uh, reauthorization bill passed. We've done our job. Now it's your job to get the Senate to do their job. Uh, so I want to thank all the FAA employees who worked day and night to ensure that no stone was left unturned when it came to reviewing. MAX 9 inspection instructions, as well as the airline maintenance technicians who are implementing these instructions to ensure that aircraft can safely transport passengers again. Uh, NTSB Chair Hamandi did a great job, and she's having some of us over to, for a briefing later today and showing us some of the problems, and we appreciate that. She's uh, been thorough. Um, based on what has been communicated to us and the public thus far, that work's been outstanding. So we must do everything we can to pass our next reauthorization. We've done that. The next deadline, March 8th, is quickly approaching. We actually need our Senate colleagues to act uh, because we need to make sure that the uh, air traffic control has more people. And 
beefed up. There are tricky issues with the reauthorization. Our committee worked in a bipartisan way to find common ground and pass a bill that contains hundreds of provisions that will preserve and enhance the aviation system and ensure a robust and vibrant future for U.S. aviation. Uh, that bill passed by an overly bipartisan margin, and uh, we hope the Senate can be bipartisan as well. Uh, I look forward to your testimony. Um, appreciate the work of Chairman Graves, Ranking Member Larson, and Chairman, the other Graves <laughs> Chairman. Uh, we put together a good bill, and we hope that we can have uh, uh, success and confidence in the American public for airplanes and flying, and that we don't lose business to Airbus. Um, the French have already made overtures. Uh, what they've tried to do to make sure that there are safe planes produced all over the world but particularly, I guess, they're thinking of in France and Airbus. So that's an important industry to America to have it growing. So good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Ranking Member Cohen. Now recognize the Chairman of the Full Committee, uh, Chairman Sam Graves, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Graves and Ranking Member Cohen for, uh, for the hearing. And thank you, Administrator Whitaker, for, uh, for coming in. It's a pleasure to have you before the Aviation Committee. The United States Aviation System has been a major focus of our committee's um, work uh, this Congress. Last year, we overwhelmingly, as been, has been the theme here so far today, we overwhelmingly passed a comprehensive bipartisan uh, aviation administration reauthorization that is going to dramatically improve American aviation and the FAA. Unfortunately, the bill, as has been pointed out, and its many improvements have been held up in the Senate for more than six months. Unfortunately, the Senate, it appears, that the Senate is poised to resume its markup uh, of the RFAA bill in a few days. And I look forward to seeing if it finally happens. And I look forward to sitting down with our Senate uh, Commerce Committee counterparts to start reconciling the, uh, the two bills. Serious issues within our aviation system have played out time and time again on the nightly news. And in my opinion, the consequences uh, of having no long-term FAA bill are exacerbating them. Now, more than ever, American aviation and FAA need some bold direction from Congress, and we can't afford business as usual or, or half measures. And our bill will secure the growth and robust leadership the American people deserve in their aerospace system. And while Congress continues to move the FAA reauthorization uh, towards the finish line, we're looking to you or depending on you uh, to pick up that slack. Many of the provisions in the House Pass bill are non-controversial and can be implemented by the FAA without any additional authority from Congress. And I'd urge you and your staff to uh, start laying the groundwork for an expeditious and, and uh, efficient uh, agency implementation of the, uh, of the provisions with uh, congressional intent, in line with the congressional intent. intent. Um, today is a great opportunity for members to highlight the aviation, their aviation priorities that matter to them and ensure that their issues are heard and understood and, uh, and hopefully are addressed. Um, we also want to hear what your impressions of the agency are since you've uh, uh, taken over the agency, since your confirmation, and what your priorities are going, uh, uh, obviously, moving forward. And finally, um, we look forward to hearing an update on what the FAA is doing regarding um, the Flight 1282 accident and what you've learned um, so far. I do want to thank you, Administrator, for and your staff um, for your very effective communication so far uh, relating to the incident and your related findings uh, that you found so far. Open communication, I think, is important, uh, a very important com component uh, in the committee, having confidence in the actions taken by uh, the FAA, and I hope that uh, this continues as the agency uh, progresses with its oversight work and audits, and we all share the same goal of ensuring that, that um, the safety uh, of our aviation system and, and maintaining that gold standard that, uh, that we all talk about. So with that, thank you again for, uh, uh, for coming before the committee. And, uh, and with that, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Larson, to recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just one more, Administrator Whitaker. Um, thanks for joining us today. Appreciate it very much. Uh, we got a lot to discuss. Um, this hearing comes at a critical time. First, we have to review the implementation of the 2018 FAA reauthorization, which expired last September. Second, we have to continue to push for the passage of a comprehensive long-range 2023 FAA reauthorization, which passed the House last July. 
And finally, we must examine the, uh, the problems that the recent 737 MAX 9 incident exposed. Safety has always been this committee's top priority, and the aviation system here in the U.S. is, responsibly, uh, is responsible for safely transporting hundreds of millions of passengers each year without fear or of harm or injury. Americans have to have the full confidence in our aviation system. That confidence must be justified. This committee must ensure the FAA has the resources and tools it needs to effectively conduct its investigations, its audits, and enforcement actions. And always, we have to uh, main, uh, remain vigilant to ensure something like this accident, that the, uh, that the uh, likelihood of, the, of this accident happening uh, is decreased substantially. On January 5th, the 737 MAX 9 accident was terrifying to everybody on board, but thanks to the calm and professional actions of the flight crew, everyone landed safely. And I fully support, as this committee does, the FAA's decisive response to this accident, which included grounding the effective MAX 9 fleet, a separate investigation into whether Boeing delivered a non-compliant aircraft to its customer, an overarching audit of Boeing's MAX production lines and its, supplier and its suppliers, and a prohibition on increasing Boeing's 737 MAX production rate until its quality control issues are resolved. Unfortunately, it's not the first time we've seen aircraft quality control issues in recent history. In May of 21, then Chair DeFazio and I wrote to the department, to the FAA, and to Boeing with concerns about no less than nine reports of quality control issues at Boeing production facilities. Since then, there have been dozens more reports of similar issues leading to emergency fixes and delays in production. The safety culture of any organization flows from the top, and I urge the Boeing leadership to take time now to examine that culture that they've currently that it is currently instilled and to improve. I look forward to the implementation of the 2020 certification reform bill which this committee passed, including the recommendations from the Boeing Safety Culture Review. Boeing has some of the most skilled, hardworking and technically proficient workers in the world, and they depend on their leadership to instill the right policies so they can effectively do their jobs. These dedicated women and men who work at Boeing plants deserve answers, and the flying public deserves answers. I also look forward to the NTSB's preliminary report and the findings of the FAA's investigations. I'll continue to work with uh, the chairs of the committee and, 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 uh, and subcommittee and the ranking member to take any potential legislative or oversight actions needed to ensure the safety in our skies. Now moving on to the reauthorization. As the committee continues its oversight of the MAX 9, accident response, we can't forget our other responsibilities. We passed an FAA bill in July. It passed 351 to 69. We are waiting Senate action. And this bill created a framework to ensure a safer, cleaner, greener, and more innovative and accessible U.S. aviation system. On aviation safety, there are numerous safety gaps that have to be addressed since the last authorization, which were enumerated in the recent NAS safety review team report. The House bill um, addresses these issues, including the hiring of air traffic control, the installation of service, surface surveillance and detective technology, and Administrator Whitaker, I look forward to hearing your takeaways from that safety review report and what the FAA is doing to implement the uh, recommendations. We have to do more to ensure all passengers can travel safely and with dignity. The House bill improves training for airline personnel and contractors on assisting travelers with disabilities and mobility devices and directs the DOT to reduce damage to wheelchairs and mobility aids. Administrator Whitaker, I want to hear how the FAA is working with DOT and airlines to do more for passengers with disabilities. We have a talented aviation workforce in this country, and the FAA, FAA reauthorization bill triples funding for the FAA's aviation workforce development programs to expand the talent pipeline to all Americans. I look forward to hearing what the FAA can do more to recruit, train, and retain the expertise that we need to lead globally. We also have to provide a clear and predictable framework for innovators to scale new entrants safely while ensuring the needs of local communities are addressed. Our bill requires the FAA, as, as an example, to issue beyond visual line of sight or BVLOS, B, BVLOS requirements for drone operations and ensuring their safe integration into the, into the skies and creating jobs. And so, Administrator, I want to hear more about what the FAA is doing on the BVLOS uh, rulemaking and your work to integrate these um, technologies. The recent Boeing 737-9 MAX, uh, MAX 9 door plug accident is yet a reminder of what is at stake if we continue to delay addressing systemic safety issues in the U.S. aviation ecosystem. That is in part why the Senate needs to move 
bill um, forward so we can start to negotiate a long-term FA reauthorization to ensure the FA and NTSB have the authorities and resources that they need to do their important work. Thank you very much. Yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Larson. Uh, recognize uh, Ranking Member Cohen for instructions and unanimous consent request. Thank you, Administrator Whitaker. You probably know these things, but there's a lighting system in front of you. Uh, green, get started. Yellow, get ready to end. Wrap it up. Red, it's over. Uh, ask unanimous consent that the witnesses' full statements be included in the record without objection, so ordered. And also ask unanimous consent that today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may be submitted to them in writing without objections, so ordered. And the last unanimous consent is the record for 15 days for any additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in today's hearing without objection, so ordered. Three of them in a row. I yield back. You're on. Without objection, uh, so ordered. Thank you, uh, Ranking Member Larson. Uh, again, Administrator, I want to welcome you. Appreciate you being here today. Uh, written testimony has been included in part of the record. The subcommittee asks you to limit your oral remarks to five minutes. Uh, with that, Administrator Whitaker, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Graves, Chairman Graves, um, Ranking Members Larson and Cohen, and members of the subcommittee. Uh, thanks for giving me an opportunity to discuss the, the current and future priorities of the FAA. Uh, our number one priority is safety. Uh, recent events, especially the January 5th incident involving the Boeing 737 MAX 9, have shown us we can't become complacent when it comes to maintaining safety and public confidence in the aviation system. Since being sworn in as administrator, I have focused on addressing potential race, uh, risks to the to the safety of our national airspace, uh, particularly in three areas, significant safety events, air traffic controller hiring, and continuous safety improvement. Last year, we saw an uptick in significant safety events, including runway incursions and close calls around airports. In response, the FAA tasked an independent safety review team to look into these issues. Uh, they provided a report to me in November, <clears throat> and we have already begun implementing many of those recommendations. To mitigate the risk of incursions, we're pursuing a range of strategies and solutions, including better data analytics, pilot and controller outreach, improved airport signage, and runway and taxiway redesign. We're also committed to continued development and deployment of technologies that enhance runway safety. We will continue to work this issue until we reach our goal of zero significant safety events. The safety of the U.S. aviation system is due in large part to the skilled and dedicated air traffic controllers who work the system. To maintain our safety record, the agency must accelerate the pace of recruiting, training, and hiring to meet increasing traffic volume while also integrating safely new technologies and new entrants into our system. We're taking immediate steps to grow the controller workforce uh, through several key initiatives. We're filling every seat at our Air Traffic Controller Academy in Oklahoma City. We're expanding the use of advanced training and facilities across the country, including upgrading simulators in 95 towers. Just last week, uh, we installed the first tower at, uh, at Austin Airport in Texas. We're working with aeronautical colleges to move graduates quickly to on-the-job training. And we've initiated year-round hiring for experienced controllers from the, from the military or from private industry. During my first three months as administrator, I met with controllers in Boston, Philadelphia, Dallas, and here at DC in the tower. In those conversations, controller fatigue came up repeatedly as a top concern, caused in large part by shifting schedules and challenging overtime requirements. Increasing our controller ranks will help mitigate risks associated with controller fatigue. Additionally, we have stood up a panel of fatigue experts to review the latest science on sleep needs and how that can be applied to work requirements and scheduling. We expect to receive the panel's report later this spring. The third priority is to continuously improve our safety processes and procedures. For example, our Air Traffic Safety Oversight Department now reports directly to me. This gives me unfiltered, candid feedback on the state and quality of the organization. We are also exploring how the agency can improve data accessibility 
and collaborate with stakeholders to collect and analyze data across our aviation system. Data is crucial to identifying and mitigating significant risks and emerging safety trends. To support these efforts, I plan to hold a discussion tomorrow with senior leadership from major US airlines on how we can share information more transparently and improve our safety management systems. The need to be vigilant on safety came clearly into focus on January 5th with the incident involving Alaska Airlines Flight 1282 when the mid -le left mid-cabin door plug blew out of a Boeing 737 MAX 9 shortly after departure. I want to commend the flight and cabin crews for their professionalism and heroic actions to ensure the safety of everyone on board during that emergency. Less than 24 hours following the incident, the FAA took decisive action to ground 171 MAX 9 airplanes. We then approved a thorough inspection and maintenance process that was performed on each of the grounded aircraft prior to returning to service. We've begun an audit of Boeing's production and quality control practices, and we've informed Boeing that the FAA will not grant any production expansion of the MAX until we're satisfied the quality control issues uncovered during this process are resolved. Going forward, we will have more boots on the ground, closely scrutinizing and monitoring production and manufacturing activities. Boeing employees are encouraged to use our FAA hotline to report any safety concerns. Let me stress, the safety of the flying public is our mission, and we will continue to, it will continue to inform our decision-making going forward. I'm honored to lead the FAA team of more than 45,000 dedicated employees who work every day to meet our mission of ensuring we have the best and the safest aviation system in the world. I'm confident in our agency's ability to address our current challenges and those that lie ahead. I also want to confirm, as Chairman Graves alluded to, uh, really commend the bipartisan effort in the House toward completing a long-term FAA reauthorization bill. I look forward to working with Congress as it finalizes this vital uh, legislation. Uh, thank you for your continued support of FAA, and I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you, Administrator. I uh, recognize myself for questions. Uh, in 2020, Congress passed the Aircraft Certification Safety and Accountability Act in response to design flaws which contributed, um, <clears throat> which contributed to the crashes of two Boeing 737 MAX aircraft. Uh, one of the provisions of that bill requires aircraft manufacturers to implement uh, safety management systems. Given what you've learned so far from uh, the Alaska Airlines Flight 1282 incident and challenges that Boeing's had with quality control, is the FAA considering further action with SMS uh, requirements um, and for aircraft parts suppliers or other entities involved in aircraft manufacturing, whether that be rulemaking, um, regulatory changes, or requesting changes in the law? Uh, thank you, Chairman Graves. That's a great question. I, the SMS process is really the, the, the core technology for our safety system. So we have a rule now that rolls this out to uh, manufacturers and Part 135 operators. Uh, Boeing has been voluntarily deploying an SMS system. Uh, one thing we've learned in this uh, particular set of circumstances with the Alaska flight was that we need to make sure those SMS systems are talking to each other and we need to make sure we're getting all the data that we can from those systems and have the tools to analyze those. To your specific question, uh, the rule that is out there uh, covers manufacturers. It doesn't necessarily cover all the component part manufacturers, but an OEM has the ability to impose those terms on it by contract, and we would expect that as part of their safety management system, they would insist on those types of controls with particularly key suppliers like Spirit Aerospace. Thank you, and obviously the committee's going to be working very closely with you and NTSB to make sure that we get this right. Um, Administrator, I'm going to be really candid. Looking back at what happened in the aftermath of the max incidences, I, I, um, incidents, I, I, I can't help but, but think that the FAA nearly two years ago, uh, while I don't think it was perfect, I think it's a pretty good roadmap on how to move forward. Can, can you give some... Um, uh, projection for what the aviation industry should be expecting in that regard? Uh, I think there, there's been a lot of um, interaction with uh, stakeholders over BV loss, and I know from, from my roles before taking this position, there's been some frustration on the, uh, how, how quickly that might be moving. We, we do expect to have the MPR, MPRM out this year, so it is a priority, and we will continue to push that forward. Um, I, I can't 
I can't emphasize enough how important I think it is for the FAA to be able to manage all of its various functions to maintain the certainty and predictability that these new entrants need into market while we're also continuing to advance our, our gold standard of, of safety in the United States. Uh, last question. I agree with that. Thank you. Um, uh, Administrator, um, there are provisions in the 2016 FAA bill and 2018 FAA bill that have not been fully implemented yet. Uh, here we are uh, advancing a 900 page uh, 23 or 24 FAA authorization bill. Um, uh, the, the House and Senate bills have a number of identical provisions. Um, uh, while it's very difficult to improve upon the perfection, the Senate is trying to add some new things. Um, uh, I, I want to hear from you, uh, what is the FAA doing to ensure that they're going to hit the ground running, be able to comply with and implement this bill in, in a manner that's as urgent as the as the law is in regard to addressing a number of the safety and new entrant and passenger experience issues that we've solved in the legislation. So what I, what I can say is I can commit to you that uh, when, the, when this bill passes, we will, we will work hard to work together uh, to, to have work plans on all of these various initiatives and communicate with you on our expectations as far as when we can meet those. So I, I think what we can do is make sure we have good open communication about how we'll execute on the, on the provisions of that bill. Um, Administrator, my 30 seconds here, I'm just going to say that as much blood, sweat, and tears as, as the folks up here, the aviation team has, has gone through over the past few years in putting this legislation together, striving to reach bipartisan consensus and addressing many of the urgent issues in the aviation industry, I am hopeful that the FAA will, will treat the implementation with the same urgency as, as we have in, in putting the legislation together. Yeah, we recognize will, we will and we, we appreciate that effort. We, we welcome this bill. Thank you. Recognize Ranking Member Cohen for five minutes. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Administrator, what parts of the production oversight and quality assurance of Boeing airplanes are considered delegated by the FAA to the manufacturer, and how does the FAA oversee Boeing representatives when they're performing those delegated functions? Well, there are a couple of answers to that question. One, one we, have, we have tasked MITRE to actually look sort of at a technical level, level on where the delegations are and what our options are with respect to delegation. Quality control and quality assurance are a key function for a manufacturer. Uh, so it, it normally falls within the purview of that manufacturer, although there's no reason to not have those types of functions done by a third party. So I think that's something we want to look at as well. Um, at a, at a macro level, I think with, with manufacturing, there has been uh, an oversight approach that has focused heavily on audit, uh, checking the paperwork to make sure it's correct and making sure the systems are in place. Uh, we are migrating to a system that is, I would call, audit plus. So we're going to have more of a surveillance component, much like you would find on, on the flight line or in maintenance stations where inspectors are actually on the ground talking to people and, and looking at the work that's being done. So we're proposing at this point to expand the oversight approach to include both audit and, and inspection, which is why we're moving inspectors into the facilities. I, I presume we look at what's been done around the country, world and get best practices on all these things? Well, we like to think that we're best practices. And, uh, I like to think that more. too, and we may be, but Airbus kind of claims that they're Doing pretty yeah, good. We, we do we do pay attention to what others are doing. I think uh, in, in this case, I think we know what we need to do next, which is to have more on the ground um, um, uh, presence to to verify what's going on. So, thank you, sir. The committee passed into law the Aircraft Certification Safety and Accountability Act, which was a direct response to the Max Eight crashes. Can you provide an update to us on what the FAA's implementation of that has been, particularly the sections we highlighted in the letter that we sent you last week? I can. The, the sections that you specifically highlighted, um, we have um, completed much of that work. Um, you highlighted section 102 of around SMS, so that rule has, has been pushed out and SMS systems are being deployed. The culture survey of section 103 is due within a month. Uh, we're very much looking forward to getting that data around Boeing safety culture. Uh, that, will, that will inform some of our uh, adjustments to the risk model approach. Uh, we've updated the ODA policy under 107. We've uh, completed the uh, standing up the EC and SC for compliance under 122. And 125 incorporated the 
uh, ODA best practices into our process. Thank you, sir. And I'd like to take two of my pet issues, which are also important issues to I think everybody on the committee, and that's evacuation of airplanes in the uh, net required 90 seconds and also seat size that's safe for people to ingress and, and e e egress. Uh, we passed laws to say that they had to do a study uh, on seat size and on evacuation. And what they did on evacuation was uh, embarrassingly poor and uh, didn't have a model of what an aircraft looks like in the passengers. It had nobody over, I think, 60 years of age and nobody under seven or eight or whatever. And they, they claimed that was for liability purposes. Well, you know, that, that's, that's hooey. And they also didn't have any dogs on there and any packages or people with the disabilities, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there were 26,000 comments in response to that uh, seat act that uh, the FAA requested public comments out of 26,000 comments. Considering the request closed in November 1 of 2022, uh, can, what can we expect the FAA, when can we expect the FAA to issue a final rule on the issue of uh, seat dimensions? So um, I'm familiar with the work that's gone on around that and, and those comments. Um, I, I think it's important for us to make the distinction between um, what might be a economic regulation and what's a safety regulation. Um, so a lot of the comments focused on more, I want more legroom type of comments versus safety uh, provisions. But we're, we're taking all those comments into, into account that the, typically with ev evacuations, the, the, the problems tend to be uh, piling up at the exits rather than getting out of the seats. Uh, so there, there have, we've had trouble identifying issues of, around um, difficulty with seats. It's more tends to be uh, piling up on the exits. But all, all that information has been considered and, and we'll certainly take your feedback as well, sir. Thank you. I've got to close out, but I appreciate you're giving serious consideration to getting this done. Seat size does have to do with getting out of the plane. And if you're crowded in there, you've got somebody next to you that's a, a, a physically challenged because of girth, it makes it difficult to get out. And I can't imagine people doing 90. In Japan, it was 18 minutes. Yeah. So if you work on this 90 seconds, work on the seat size, realize safety and, and comfort can be the same. I yes, yield sir. back. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Cohen. Uh, chairman's going to defer to uh, Mr. Perry for five minutes. I thank the chairman. Thank you, Administrator Whitaker. I'm going to start out with a couple of perfunctory questions here. Would you agree that the Airport Improvement Program Grant Assurance 19 Operations and Maintenance requires the following? I'm going to read this right out of the manual here. The airport and facilities which are necessary to serve the aeronautical users of the airport, other than facilities owned by or controlled by the United States, shall be operated at all times in a safe and serviceable condition and in accordance with the minimum standards for maintenance and operation and it will not cause or permit any activity or actions thereon which would interfere with its use for airport purposes. Is that, do you agree with that? I mean, it's out of the I manual. I mean, I'm not familiar with it by word, but it sounds okay. right. Okay, yeah, it sounds right. Back. Okay, so would you also agree that the FAA Airport Compliance Manual Section 22.6 request for interim use of aeronautical property for other uses generally requires the FAA to approve the use of airport facilities for non aeronautical purposes, and in fact, it explicitly states that the FAA approval shall not be granted if the FAA determines that aeronautical demands, an aeronautical demand is likely to exist within the period of the of interim use. I, I believe that's accurate. That's my understanding. Yeah, it's right out of the manual. I'll, I'll give it to you if you want to see it. So these documents from the FAA make it abundantly clear that airports are restricted in their ability to use their facilities for non-aeronautical purposes. And when they are doing that, or when they're requesting so, they must receive FAA approval. The restrictions are in place to protect the flying public and the safety, but also to protect the investments that taxpayers have made in federally funded uh, airports. Yet, I will tell you, I've seen a disturbing trend in cities choosing to use their airports, such as Chicago, O'Hare, Midway, Boston's Logan's, as facilities to house illegal foreign nationals brought here by the administration's, well, I'm going to say failure to enforce the immigration laws on the books. Um, and that clearly falls, in my mind, into the category of non-aeronautical use. Now, my question to you is, has the FAA approved any request to use airports to house illegal foreign nationals? So to, to your um 
to your explanation, uh, the FAA does have a role in, in. I know it does, but I'm just asking if you've approved, if you're the administrator, has the FAA approved any requests to house illegal foreign nationals? So I'm going to answer that if you'll let me. Okay. My understanding I'm, is. I, I just want to use the time efficiently here. Yeah. So the FAA does approve requests for community use. Uh, whatever the category, there's a huge number of categories for community use, and our criteria is whether it interrupts aeronautical uses or is otherwise disruptive. So, uh, how many how many requests have been approved for for housing illegal foreign nationals? Uh, my understanding is there's been one airport that has made that request. And so, the been. others that I mentioned, well, was the one that made the request any of the ones that I mentioned? I believe it was, uh, it was either Kennedy or O'Hare, I can't remember for sure. Okay, so it could be O'Hare, but then it wouldn't be Midway or Logan, yet they're housing illegal foreign nationals at the airport. Um, did the FAA make the required determination that no aeronautical demand is likely to exist? This is an airport, and I'm reading right from your regulation here, uh, Chapter 22.6. Did, did the FAA make that determination? The, the, the determination was that it did not interfere with aeronautical uses. So, so in, in that case, I guess the FAA won't enforce its grant assurances, which it says right here, literally on number one, these assurances shall be complied with in performance of grant agreements for airport development, airport planning, noise compatibility program grants for airport sponsors. So the federal government's paying for it, they make the agreement, agree to it, and then don't follow it, and the FAA is not going to do anything about it. I, I, I'll, I want to yield some time to a friend, but let me just ask this question. How does walling off portions of the airport to house unvetted illegal foreign nationals, which passengers in America have to walk beside, these are unvetted illegal foreign nationals, how does that pr promote safety or utility or efficiency in these airports? I think you're out of my area of expertise. I'm not familiar with that circumstance. I think that answers the question. I'm going to yield uh, some time to my good friend from Texas, Mr. Nels. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Administrator, uh, I am going to reference a letter uh, dated February 5th, 2024, to the Honorable Maria Cantwell and Honorable Ted Cruz. Are you familiar with this letter on February 5th that you sent? Uh, I'm not sure what the topic is. Okay, I, I'm going to make sure because I've only got. I'm going to make sure that you get a copy of this letter. So when it comes to me, I have a lot of questions regarding this letter. I yield back. Thank you, um, gentlemen. Yields back. Recognize the ranking member of the full committee, Mr. Larson, for five minutes. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Administrator, for for coming uh, today, helping us out on some things. Uh, first question: I had, In your testimony, you mentioned the hotline that um, that uh, workers can call, as well as a whistleblower hotline. Could you? Do you have that phone number? Can you, for the record, state what it is? Can you remind folks where they can go in order to make that call? We, we, we have, a, we have a, a link on our website, so faa.gov, where you can go find access to that hotline. Uh, we've also set up a, a specific hotline for Boeing employees, which we have had communicated uh, out at the factory so they can reach us directly. Is that on faa.gov as well? Yes, yes, it is. So for Boeing employees, they can go to faa.gov right now if they have any uh, concerns. Absolutely. That, is that a confidential communication? It's, it's run through a very confidential process. We have a, a group that focuses on whistleblowers to make sure identity is, is protected and that appropriate actions are taken. Thank you very much. Uh, I know that you've, uh, FAA has uh, chosen uh, to put inspectors in the facilities. Uh, does that include uh, in, in spirit as well? We do have ins inspectors in spirit as well, yes. Yeah, and, uh, and that's new. And can you give us a range of the numbers of people that you've deployed uh, into the Boeing and spirit facilities? I think we, we have about uh, two dozen at, at Boeing and, and maybe a half a dozen at, at spirit. Yeah. And can you give an indication of whether you think that'll be um, uh, permanent? Is this going to be short term? Like, when did, how long does this last? Is it, is it part of what you need to be doing? as part of a permanent solution? So we're, we're undertaking a six-week audit, so we're in the middle of that now, and that audit will give us guidance on where we need to go. I think we're also gonna look at this culture survey that's due at the end of the month, uh, and then make a determination of how many folks we need on the ground in both places. Uh, so we haven't made that determination, but I do anticipate we will wanna keep people on the ground there. So we, we don't know how many yet, but um, we do think that presence will be warranted. 
Do you have any initial thoughts um, on the impact of the Max 9 uh, accident and its, in, and its uh, um, influence in your decision making about ODA authorities um, and how much to pull back uh, from Boeing at this time? I think the, I think the, the events of, of January 5th, it, it really created two issues for us. One, what's wrong with this airplane? Uh, but two, what's going on with the production uh, at Boeing? And there have been issues in the past and they don't seem to be getting resolved. So we feel like we need to have a heightened level of oversight uh, to really get after that. So uh, it was certainly triggered by the, the MAX 9, yes. Uh, but nothing, uh, no, no permanent decision yet uh, about uh, uh, removing some authority from the ODA organization at Boeing? No, no, uh, on no a permanent, permanent basis. decisions. I mean, we've, we've tasked MITRE to give us uh, a view on what the options are. Um, we, we've, uh, I've heard uh, Boeing CEO mention an option for third-party uh, quality control. Uh, so I think, I think it's important that we, we look at all options on the table and understand how do we make changes that are going to give us a different result than we've had. Yeah, thanks. Um, I want to move to um, a little bit more to um, the FA bill uh, that we passed. Um, I jokingly asked you ahead of time if I was going to ask you if it, it was a great bill or greatest bill. Um, but we really want to um, impress upon the Senate how important this is to get. They're trying to get it done, but how important it is to get a final bill done. Uh, is there anything in that bill? Um, can, can you can you talk to anything in that bill that you would have needed ahead of this, or do you have ahead of January fifth, or do you have everything that you need for at least for this particular um, investigation? Well, I guess I'll make two comments. One is. We, we really appreciate the effort on the bill because it, it creates a huge amount of disruption to not have it. So the constant running up against deadlines, I've only been there three months and I probably had a dozen meetings on what happens if there's a shutdown, what happens if we don't have authorization. So it, it does create a, a lot of uncertainty for us. I, I don't see anything in particular that, you know, it's possible I'll come back in six months and tell you that, you know, we need something. Uh, we, I think we're going to need more boots on the ground. We're going to need more inspectors. We don't have that many inspectors on the, on the aircraft certification side of the house. Um, so that will be a, uh, an addition of manpower. Um, but we haven't scoped that, and I think we can do it within our uh, current authorities as long as we can find the funds for it. Yeah, great. Um, so I, I did outline some, some of the issues in the uh, 23 bill uh, on accessibility, on uh, BV loss, a few other things, and we'll just get back to you with those um, uh, for the record Great. as well. But uh, thanks for thanks for coming up. Appreciate it. And we yield back. Yep. Thank you, Ranking Member Larson. Uh, Chairman Westman is going to defer, and we're going to recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Mast. Thank you, Chairman. Administrator, uh, I want to talk a little bit about training and air traffic controllers, and I want to go back to November. Uh, you announced that the FAA would expand Collegiate Training Initiative, also known as CTI, uh, and those programs to harness specifically the underutilized capacity among college programs that meet the FAA's equivalent levels of safety to help train air traffic controllers. We all know that's something that we need and help address that shor shortage of, you know, potentially 3,000, uh, maybe more, maybe a little less air traffic controllers, certified controllers. And my question is, I want you to bring us up to speed on what the FAA has done since November to implement a, a new enhanced CTI program. What's being done? So we've done a, a, what we're trying to do is make sure that these schools are duplicating the curriculum that we teach at uh, the academy. So we're, we've put some, some definition around what that curriculum is and also looking at what physical tools they need. So flight simulators, train, tower simulators, things of that nature, to put together a very clear uh, curriculum. And my goal is to make sure that in the academic year 24-25, we're actually executing on this so that we start to see graduates from those schools come directly into FAA to be controllers. The immediacy of the issue is why we're pushing so hard. So um, of the couple dozen uh, CTI schools out there, we're, we're hoping to have at least half of them able to start training students beginning in the fall. Do you see new programs opening up as a result of your efforts? 
I, I'd like to see that. It hasn't been our initial focus. We're trying to work with the schools that are already sort of set into that space, but I don't see any reason why other schools, particularly those with a technical bent, uh, can't have this program as well. Okay. Uh, that's the extent of my questioning today, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the remainder of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mass. Recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Stanton. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and to the administrator. Thank you for uh, being here, for coming to speak to us uh, today, your first hearing before this, uh, this committee. Uh, Americans are upset. They have a right to be upset. Last month, door plugs failed on a 737 MAX 9 and caused the door plug to fly off mid-flight. Thank God no one was seriously injured in this accident, but make no mistake, this was a close call too close. The incident, along with reports of near misses of planes colliding as they depart and arrive at America's airports in the past year, is concerning and frankly unacceptable to all of us on this committee. We need to pass a comprehensive Federal Aviation Administration reauthorization bill that's currently sitting in the United States Senate to give the FAA and this administrator the tools they need to enforce safety rules and prevent catastrophe. In this very committee, we crafted a strong, bipartisan, five-year FAA bill, and the House passed it nearly unanimously. We did our job, and now the Senate needs to do, their, do theirs as quickly as uh, possible. Mr. Whitaker, as the FAA Administrator, you are the head of aviation oversight and safety. I want to underscore what the ranking member has discussed here today in terms of oversight, particularly on production facility inspections, a crucial part of making sure our planes are safe. Section 521 of the House FAA reauthorization calls for the FAA to update the risk model used to inform frequency of these inspections, but we have problems right now. Can you, in a couple sentences, explain how the agency determines the frequency of these inspections and what impact these inspections have on production. Thank you, sir. Um, the, the agency uses a risk model with respect to manufacturers. It, uh, uh, it's a fairly um, uniform survey uh, to identify the level of risk and so how many inspections would be driven by that. Uh, that model will likely evolve uh, based on the rollout of SMS systems, which should reduce risk and give us better insight into what's happening. Uh, and also in the case of Boeing, based on the culture survey that we expect to receive later this month. I think I want to address another issue that was touched upon by our ranking member, and that is the recent trend of mishandled or damaged wheelchairs uh, by aviation passengers. This recent trend uh, of mishandled or damaged wheelchair incidents by commercial airlines raises serious concerns about the systemic barriers for passengers with disabilities. How is the FAA working to prevent these incidents and imp improve accessibility for air travel for people with disabilities? Thank you, sir. The, the, uh, the, the DOT has a large role in this uh, related to how customers are treated on aircraft. So we work very closely in supporting DOT to make sure accessibility uh, is an option and that, that innovations can happen to make, make sure that is enabled. Okay, it's an important issue for us. You're gonna hear a lot more from this committee on the, Yes, sir. We need to up our game, if you will, in terms right. of improving the, air, the uh, travel experience. Uh, on near misses, I mentioned, in response to the recent trend of runway near misses at some U.S. airports, the House Pass FAA reauthorization would expand, expand grand surveillance and detection equipment at large and medium hub airports. How would increasing the deployment of this technology help air traffic controllers and flight crews? I think these near misses are one of those areas where there's a lot of ability to have uh, tailored solutions for, for each airport. Every airport is different. It has its own challenges, but a lot of these surface awareness technologies or tools in the, in the, in the tower can, can really make the difference and, and, and create awareness to avoid these types of mishaps. Thank you so much. In my remaining time, Administrator, I want to give a, a thank you. I want to thank you and the FAA for the collaborative partnership in helping Phoenix Mesa Gateway Airport expand its infrastructure to accommodate extraordinary growth. Gateway Airport is the busiest contract air traffic control tower in the region and contributes nearly $2 billion to our regional economy. They recently completed their new Terminal South Concourse, due in part to $14.4 million in the bipartisan infrastructure law funds. A ribbon cutting will be held in a couple of weeks. The cooperation between the FAA and our Arizona delegation in Congress has been crucial to this growth, and I look forward 
to a continued strong working partnership to implement innovative ways to increase capacity at Gateway. With that, I thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stanton. Uh, recognize the gentleman from Arkansas, Mr. Westman, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Graves. Thank you, Administrator Whitaker over here. Um, I want to follow up with uh, my colleague, Mr. Perry's uh, line of questioning. I know you, your whole testimony was basically about safety, and we all want safe airports. Uh, and Mr. Perry read to you from the, the manual about how a non-aeronautical purpose at an airport has to be approved by the FAA, and you stated that only one airport had approval to be used for the non-aeronautical purpose of housing migrants. Would, would you like to correct that answer, or is that the answer you want to stick by? <laughs> To my, to my knowledge, and this is not an issue that I've only been there three months, not an issue I've spent much time on, but to my knowledge, there was only one application. Uh, it's also my understanding that applications are only involved if it's uh, behind security. So, so other properties on airports uh, don't come through our office for approval. It's really just uh, uh, behind security properties. So it's well documented that many airports have been used for this purpose. Uh, so do you think these airports are in violation of any federal law, or do you think they found a way around that? I, I assume they're in compliance. I have not heard otherwise, but uh, our, our role is to make sure that the proper procedures are, are followed. This is um, an issue that I didn't think we would have to deal with in, in Congress. I, I chair the Committee on Natural Resources, and we've got a similar issue with National Park Service land where the administration has approved use of National Park Service land to build migrant shelters, which that's kind of crazy that you would think that that would even be an issue, but it, it has happened. And in uh, researching the process, how that happens, it appears that maybe Secretary Mayorkas had a lot more to do with that than even the, uh, the DOI secretary. Um, are you aware of any meetings between Secretary Mayorkas and Secretary Buttigieg to um, discuss issues of using FAA or using airports to house migrants? I am not aware of any, no. Are you aware of any meetings between other DOT or uh, DHS officials to discuss this issue? I, I am not. Have you been in any meetings um, regarding this or phone calls? Just getting briefed for this hearing. Otherwise, I have not had any meetings. Um, so is this, uh, we, we sent a letter, uh, Chairman Graves, Chairman of the full committee, uh, I think 60 some odd members signed the letter last November asking about this issue. And as of today, we've still received no response. Uh, I know you're new, but uh, why do you think we would be getting delayed on a response on this issue? I, I, I don't know, but I'm happy to follow up afterwards, sir. So you'll, you'll follow up. Will you follow up with Secretary Buttigieg as well? Uh, I'll follow up on the status of the letter, and I'll, I'll let you know. All right. Um, it's amazing that this is something that's been very well documented in the news, and there seems to be no response from the administration. And, and you, I know you're new again, but you have no uh, real knowledge of what's going on here or the rules uh, associated with it. Um, so, yeah, if you would follow up with Secretary Buttigieg and tell him we're still waiting for his response. And, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield my time, remaining time to Mr. Nail. Gentleman from Texas recognized. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, Mr. Administrator, you received, you, did you look at that letter that I referenced that was dated March 5th? You sent it to Cantwell and Ted Cruz? Yes, I have that. All right. Did, uh, uh, did you write that letter? Did I write the letter? Yes, sir. Uh, no, it was drafted for me. It was drafted for you. Who drafted it for you? Uh, I don't know. It went through a, a process as this issue was uh, uh, developed internally to respond to requests uh, for technical assistance on various issues okay. of the REAUTH bill. Is this letter the official position of the FAA to oppose the raising the mandatory retirement age without a study beforehand? Uh, the, the official position is that we don't have a position on the retirement age, but if it changes, we'd like to have data to support the change. Okay, so I want to be clear. So for everybody listening, the FAA, the administrator, does not have an official position 
on whether Congress, we passed it in the House, should raise the mandatory retirement age from 65 to 67. Our role has been to identify issues around that, and we have identified two, one about international compliance, mm -hmm. uh, and then one about understanding the data of changing the age from 65 to 67. Okay. Did ALPA influence your decision to write this letter? Did ALPA have any influence in the drafting of this letter, yes or no? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Okay, I'll yield. Gentleman yields back. <clears throat> My friend from Kansas, Ms. Davids, recognized for questions. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you to Chairman Garrett Graves and to Ranking Member Cohen. Uh, for this hearing today, and thank you also to Chairman Sam Graves and Ranking Member Larson for their leadership on passing a common sense bipartisan reauthorization of the Federal Aviation Administration in the House last year. Uh, Mr. Whitaker, welcome to the Aviation Subcommittee, and thank you for taking the time to be here. Uh, I do believe your experience and leadership will be invaluable at the FAA. Uh, I would like you to address an issue that's affecting the uh, national airspace system which is aging infrastructure and uh, functional obsolescence. The failure of the FAA's NOTAM system in January of 2023 highlights the risk to the flying public when aging, safety-critical aviation infrastructure isn't replaced in a timely way. And sadly, the FAA now operates and maintains one of the oldest collections of safety-critical aviation infrastructure in the world. Uh, one such system is uh, one such system in the NAS desperately in need of replacement is ILS or instrument landing systems. Uh, there's a map up there. I've got one here. The ILS, this ILS map demonstrates just how many 1970s era Mark I F systems are in operation in the NAS. The FAA has more than 1,200 ILS systems located at hundreds of airports across the country. The ILS is the only system approved by FAA to support all weather landings at the nation's busiest airports. As such, these systems are required to remain in operation for the foreseeable future. However, the vast majority of these safety critical systems were placed into service in the 1970s and 80s and are now functionally obsolete. In Kansas alone, 17 of the 21 systems, which is 81%, are functionally obsolete. This body passed the bipartisan infrastructure law more than two years ago with a set aside of $5 billion to replace these aging systems. But the FAA told industry leaders and members of this committee that modernization of these systems wasn't an eligible expense under the program. Then Aviation uh, Chairman Larson and I subsequently engaged in a colloquy on the floor on December 9th of 2021, which is shown here, uh, expressing congressional intent that this was in fact an eligible expense. This colloquy was shared with USDOT uh, again on August 17th, 2022, when Mr. Larson and I noticed that there was no money directed in the fiscal year 2023 FAA spend plan for replacement of these systems. We asked for a timeline and budget detailing specific allocation of IIJ resources to landing and navigational aids equipment for fiscal years 22 through 26, which you can see uh, here. The response we received, which is up now, uh, contained none of the information that we asked for. In follow-up conversations with FAA, we have yet to receive a satisfactory response as to why the acquisition and modernization of these systems has lagged. In fact, several taxpayer-funded instrument landing systems, there's 14 of them, are sitting in a cave in Independence, Missouri, simply waiting to be installed. Uh, at the FAA's current pace of modernization, which is about four to five systems per year, it would take more than 100 years to replace these systems. This means that FAA expects many of these system, safety critical systems to be in operation despite being over 100 years old. I, I can't imagine that's actually the expectation. Um, and just so we're clear what system failure looks like, the most likely impact on these airports is on capacity, on throughput, and uh, delays. When an ILS is out, runways can't be used for all, all weather operations. But there's also this inherent safety risk uh, should a system fail in the middle of uh, landing operations. So Mr. Whitaker, uh, what's the FAA's schedule for deploying these devices system-wide? And as, as you might be aware, uh, the professional aviation safety specialists have proposed a pilot program for deploying these systems within 18 months. And I'm curious if to your knowledge, is the FAA considering that proposal? Thank you for the question. Um, you, you've hit on a very <laughs> interesting issue at the FAA, which is how we fund uh, facilities, equipment, and uh, particularly uh, we're in a, a situation now where we have a lot of redundant systems in, this, in, in, in the NAS, 
uh, and facilities. We have facilities that, that need to be replaced as well. Um, with respect to the, this particular uh, issue, my understanding is that that infrastructure funding is available for deployment of those ILS systems, specifically the ones that you mentioned that are, that are uh, in storage. So my, my understanding is that that will be deployed, those funds will be used to, to begin deploying those systems. Do you, ha do you have a timeline? I, I can certainly respond to your office with some specifics on the timelines. Okay. Uh, I, I, and I would, I would very much like a specific uh, response uh, given the length of time that this has been going on. The uh, bipartisan infrastructure bill gave us a, a five-year timeline, and we're uh, over two years in. Yep. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Recognize the gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Stauber. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair, Administrator Whitaker. Uh, thanks for being with us and congratulations. Thank you. Um, Mr. Whitaker, how many positions are there at the FAA? How many positions? Well, we have 45,000 employees. 45. And what percentage of those positions are filled? Uh, I don't have a, an exact position uh, uh, number for you. Is the COVID emergency over? Uh, I believe so, yes. Yeah, May 11th, President Biden declared the emergency over. I understand you use uh, a hybrid telework model, is that correct? Uh, we, it, depends on the, it depends on the function. So obviously our controllers are all on the job, uh, but other, other employees are still in a hybrid situation. How many days a week or how many days a week do the employees have to show up in a two-week work period? Uh, the, the, the policy, again, it, becomes, it depends on the employee but, um, and the job description, but the, the baseline is four days. Yeah, so four days, your employees have to, in a two-week period, show up four days. What if your air traffic controllers only showed up four days in their work week? Would it affect commercial, general aviation? Well, as I mentioned, they show up every day for their jobs. I understand that. What I'm trying to get at is what if our controllers just showed up four out of a two-week work yeah. period, four days? Would that, would that interrupt our work? Well, they can't control traffic from home. I understand that. They certainly would. You know what I'm getting at. If they only showed up, what, would it be a problem for our airports and general aviation, commercial aviation across our country, yes or no? Of course. How do you track employee accessibility and productivity in this hybrid model? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's up to individual managers to manage their workforce uh, to meet the needs of, of, of their mission. I can just tell you from what I'm hearing from stakeholders is that accessibility to FAA staff is limited. And it seems evident that productivity is waning as several high profile rule makings are still ongoing. And you know this, uh, the rule for a regular beyond visual line of sight operation of unmanned aircraft systems. That final report was concluded in March of 2022, and now it's not expected until August of 2024. You know, and I know workplace flexibility is an important recruiting tool in our new world. However, as an agency with a safety mission first, do you find that a two-day in-person work week rather low? And it depends on the job position. So many of our employees, uh, not only controllers, but inspectors need to be uh, in place, but others, uh, it, it, it may work for working remotely. So I think it depends on the position. I, I, Administrator Whitaker, I, I believe that the FAA should hold itself to a higher standard. And the FAA's telework schedule requires, again, they are only in person two days, or correction, four days, per out period. of a two week work period. Uh, and I'd just like to point out again, our controllers are working a lot of hours, a lot of pressure on them to keep our uh, flying public safe. And speaking of controllers, the National Aerospace, Airspace System, rather, safety review team concluded that under the FAA's most recent controller workplace plan submitted to Congress, when retirements and other attrition is accounted for, the hiring plan produces a negligible improvement over today's understaffed levels, resulting in a net increase of fewer than 200 aircraft controllers by 2032. This is extremely concerning for safety and efficiency of the aviation system. 
Can you uh, reassure the committee that the FAA will prioritize this issue, conduct maximum hiring of new controls, and continue to request adequate resources from Congress to address the problem? I can. Yes, sir. Um, and I understand that the FAA has committed to maximum controlling hiring for only fiscal year 24, 25, and 26. Will the FAA commit to a longer-term maximum hiring posture since it will take a lot longer than just three years for max hiring to return to healthy controller staffing levels? We, we certainly commit to max hiring until we get healthy. What we've done is we have, there, are, there are competing staffing models at play, so we've commissioned the Transportation Research Board to review those models, so within three years we'll have a new model in place, and I will set those goals. Thank you. Last question. Um, will you pr prioritize and support general aviation uh, like you do commercial, and will you support rural airport investment and infrastructure? Absolutely. Thank you, uh, and again, congratulations. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Stauber. I uh, recognize the from Illinois, Mr. Garcia. Thank you, uh, Chairman, and uh, welcome, uh, Administrator Whitaker. As you know, uh, Boeing uh, recently withdrew its request for the MAX uh, 7 to receive a safety exemption, which would have allowed the aircraft to be certified with a known defect if granted. As you know, uh, Boeing's fleet of MAX aircraft have an anti-ice system issue that could cause the nacelle, the pod surrounding the engine, to break and fall off in certain conditions. This could have potentially catastrophic consequences. Boeing is now working on a long-term fix that will require retrofitting the entire MAX fleet. How did the FAA, in your understanding, fail to detect such a defect during the certification of the MAX 8 and MAX 9 aircraft? So my, <clears throat> my understanding on that particular issue is that that um, that potential defect was discovered in during using computer modeling uh, some years after the original certification of the aircraft um, and modeling that was required by the AXA legislation, actually. But that, that's my understanding of how that was, that was discovered. While I appreciate the FAA's attention to this topic, uh, Boeing has demonstrated time and time again that it will cut corners on safety in order to maximize profits. My second question, Administrator, is this. In response to the recent Alaska Airlines accident, the FAA uh, has launched an investigation into Boeing's compliance with manufacturing requirements. Has the FAA comprehensively engaged with employee groups, those involved in the production, uh, and have they, uh, and those who have filed whistleblower reports regarding reduction of quality assurance procedures in the manufacturing system? And if so, how is the FAA handling these reports? So we, <clears throat> on the uh, engagement uh, aspect, we, we now have uh, 20 uh, inspectors on the ground in Boeing uh, engaging with the employees at every phase of the manufacturing process. And so this is to allow us to have direct conversations with employees about what pressures they might be feeling or what instructions they're getting and what incentives they're dealing with. On the whistleblower, we, we dedicated a portal for Boeing employees, but we also have a normal portal for whistleblowers. Uh, and we have a, a pretty regimented process on how we deal with those reports to make sure the identity is protected and the, and the, and the reports are taken seriously. Should I take that to mean that there is currently engagement with those employees? Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, of course, I look forward uh, to working with the FAA to hold our aviation community to a higher standard of safety. It is equally crucial for the operation of our aviation industry. Their airport workers are paid <clears throat> livable wages. Airport workers are largely Latino, black, and immigrant workforce. They've been overlooked and underpaid for the vital role that they play in keeping our airports running. My bill, the Good Jobs for Good Airports Act, would change that. Administrator, are you committed to doing what you can to ensure that the airports uh, that the FAA oversees are delivering fair wages and benefits to all employees? Um, I'm, very, I'm very committed to making sure that they have a very safe working environment. Uh, safety is, is my mandate, and we are focused on safety 
at airports, particularly on the ramp. Uh, so we've taken some initiatives around that to make sure that those employees are in a safe environment. Thank you. Um, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. I recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Vendrew. Thank you, Chairman. Welcome, Mr. Whitaker. Yes, sir. You know, you got a tiger by the tail. Uh, yeah, I, I was going to speak on something else, and I am in a moment, but using airports for housing undocumented, that's a big deal. It's a big deal to the communities these airports are in. It's a big deal fiscally. It's a big deal for safety. And I know you're new, so I want to be fair. But we need you to drill down and tell us more what's going on. Please check thoroughly on this issue. I think it's a totally inappropriate use. Safety is our number one issue. It was never meant for housing any of these airports. There was a plan. Uh, and this is fact, it was leaked out by a whistleblower, uh, 10 different airports that they were going to house illegals in. Of course, we got a hold of it. And Atlantic City International Airport in my district, they were talking about housing up to 60,000 illegals in a community of 35,000 to 40,000 people. That's wrong. So I need some commitments from you to thoroughly drill down on this issue, to know how many airports are involved a complete list of airports that are involved, a policy coming from the FAA. We need a policy from the FAA dealing with these requests and ensuring that the FAA is part of the process in determining if we're that the FAA is part of the process in determining if, where, and when this is going to be done. And we need a complete list of requests and from whom it came. I brought this up to Secretary Buttigieg when he was here. He wasn't aware of it. Of course, we have the information. I need you to do that. I would appreciate if you get that information back to me and the entire committee. Could you commit to getting us that information? I, I can commit to making sure that we're complying with the, the law around uh, any approvals. Mr. We Whitaker, I appreciate we, that, but we, we really don't, need... We don't own the airports, so I, we don't I know, really but it, it deals... But you're a very important part of what happens at the airport. You should be included. You should be part of it. The people, quite frankly, of our districts, of our country, should be part of it as well. So I ask you to please think about that, and I would ask you to please commit to doing that. It's not a big request. It's a real obvious thing, and I'm looking forward to that report. You know, last month, the fuselage of a domestic, domestic Boeing 737 MAX exploded open at 16,000 feet. I know you're real aware of it. There are 180 people on board. We are unbelievably blessed that nobody died, that there weren't injuries, that it wasn't much worse than it re the result that we had. This accident, in my opinion, in my opinion, is the result of decades-long process of globalization. In the early 2000s, Boeing aggressively outsourced its business model. The strategy peaked in 2005 with the sale of the Wichita-based Spirit Aero Systems. I know you're aware of that. Spirit Aero is now a, quote, global corporation. And it has been identified by the FAA as responsible. You all identified it as responsible for the faulty components behind the Alaskan Airlines incident. This is one example of how Boeing's outsourcing has led to Boeing's decline. And Boeing has hidden its decline, in my opinion, and many, by appealing to diversity, equity, and inclusion and in, for its investors, because it's a cool thing to be. And the investors that are interested in that were more likely to invest. And their stock, no doubt, has gone up 400% since their, their product has gone down, but their stock has go, gone up which is real interesting. You know, you should be worried about safety when you're selling private equity firms, but they were not. This is a one-two punch of globalization and social engineering. It doesn't belong. Job number one is safety. Job number one is safety for every man, woman, and child that go in those airports. Uh, and it's a company that is struggling to reliably produce, produce safe aircraft. Mr. Whitaker. Are you concerned by the trajectory of Boeing as an American institution? An American institution. Are you concerned? Uh, my concern is that Boeing makes safe aircraft. So I'm less concerned about externalities. I'm more concerned <clears throat> about the quality of the aircraft coming off the line. And that's well, I would maintain it's part and parcel. They have a job to worry about safety, efficiency, 
uh, and when you're worried about all these other issues and not the green economy and everything else, you should, you know, that should be your job number one. And I hope you have a plan to put them back on track. I sent you a letter in December about the FAA Technical Center, uh, and I would like to submit this record for the uh, for chairman for the record. The needs include national airspace systems, electrical utilities, and technology transfer programs. My time has run out. I wish I had a half hour with you. I appreciate you being there. I would hope that you would take my request seriously because the American public takes it seriously. And I thank you and wish you good luck. Gentlemen's time has expired. Recognize the general lady from Alaska, Ms. Peltola, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Administrator morning. Uh, Whitaker. General aviation accident rates in Alaska continue to outpace the rest of the country. Can you provide an update on FAA's implementation of the recommendations of the 2023 FAA Alaska Aviation Safety Initiative Tiger Team, including the eight automated weather ob obser observing systems, installation scheduled to have been completed in September of 2023? Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, so I, 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 uh, fully supportive of the unique nature of Alaska and the role of general aviation in that uh, I had a chance to visit when I was deputy uh, and got to tour quite a bit of some of the remote facilities. And I think the FASI program has really been uh, a, a very strong program and we, and we support that um, and we'll continue to support that. On the, on the AWOS, I know that uh, I got briefed on this ahead of the hearing and I, I understand that seven of the eight have been deployed. Um, the, the eighth is inaccessible due to some flooding or some other climate conditions. So uh, we will make sure that, that that continues as well. Okay, excellent. And as you say, Alaska is unique. I think 82% of our communities are not accessible by any other way except airplane. Um, the FAA passed, or the, the House passed the FAA reauthorization bill and it included Section 510, the Don Young Aviation Safety Initiative, which calls on aviation stakeholders to work together to reduce the rate of fatal accidents by 90% by 2033 in Alaska, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and other American territories. And this provision includes a number of initiatives designed to further the objective. And I'm wondering it, what you see as steps that are necessary to achieve this kind of reduction. Well, I, I think I think it's laudable that we have such an aggressive goal, and 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 that is how we brought the, the commercial aviation accident rate down to its current level, um, and getting the stakeholder groups working together. I think with with GA, there there are a lot of technologies that can be deployed to create better situational awareness in the cockpit, and more tools, particularly around weather and unpredictable weather, um, but also redundancies around landing systems and the like. So I think. This is an area where technology and quick deployment of technology can, can really be a, a benefit. So it's, I think it's really positive that all these stakeholders are working together toward that. Thank you so much. Thank you. I yield back my time, Mr. Chairman. Regrettably, I yield to Mr. Mann. Uh, thank you, and thank you for being here today, Administrator Whitaker. I represent the big first district of Kansas. There's a strong relationship between the Kansas economy and aviation. There are 91,000 jobs attributed to the aviation industry in my state, including 42,000 from the aerospace manufacturing um, segment. Aviation ranks second in economic impact in Kansas only to agriculture. For our aviation industry to thrive, the FAA needs a roadmap of updated congressional priorities to adopt long overdue policy changes and regulatory requirements. Delays in rulemaking and insufficiencies in the workforce are bottlenecking the industry. It's imperative that Congress passes the reauthorization bill so the FAA, its workforce, and the aviation industry are able to address the backlog of concerns that my colleagues and I have all been raising for months so that American, America can return to its gold standard status in aviation. Uh, a few questions, um, Mr. Whitaker. We've heard a lot about the FAA's rulemaking process and the importance of it for innovation uh, safety and international leadership. What will you do under your tenure to make this process more timely, transparent, and accountable? Uh, thank you, sir. I, I think there, transparency in general, I think, needs to be improved and, and efficiency needs to be improved delivering services, registrations, for example, uh, certification process. So we are working on those issues. 
rulemaking is a little different because it's driven by the uh, uh, Administrative Procedures Act, so we are required to have certain time periods for comment and certain process and procedures. I think the, the, the best we can do is make sure we get that transparency and, and know where we are in the process and try to keep the process moving. Uh, rulemaking can have a dozen different steps in it and just make sure that we're continuing to keep sunlight on that and, 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 and keep things moving as quickly as we can within the confines of that law. And uh, can you specifically address um, unmanned aerial systems? Um, in other words, you know, how is the FAA adapting its regulatory framework to accommodate the rapid evolution of unmanned aerial systems um, and advanced air mobility technologies? I think we got to acknowledge that this, you know, is is here to stay. It's, it's a growing part of the aviation industry. Tremendous potential for Kansas and the rest of the country. And how do we make sure the FAA is is appropriately and quickly reviewing these new technologies? Um, with safety front and center, but also not having unnecessary delays as well. Yeah, it, it is it is one of our big challenges, and, and, and right now I think it's mostly been dealt with in, in a, in a one-off manner. So I think recently we've gotten much better on the small UAS and through this exemption process, so we've been able to satisfy a lot of the BV loss operations and such. Uh, advanced air mobility currently would have to operate under existing rules, which you know, is doable but not scalable, if you will. So I think what we need to do is work as an industry with all stakeholders to develop that roadmap that integrates all these technologies uh, and tries to keep up with their pace of development. So I, I think we don't want to be in the way, but we need to make sure that they're being deployed safely, and that's our top priority. Yeah, I agree. As an aside, you know, I, I hear from multiple manufacturers in Kansas um, of all sizes that just talk about how long it takes to for the FAA to respond to new ideas on, on how do we do things better, how do we innovate, how do we make sure that the U.S. continues, you know, that, we, that we are the world leader uh, in the aviation space. A big part of that, of course, is manufacturing. A big part of that is having an FFA that's, that's adaptable, um, understands technology, understands um, where the industry is heading, and, uh, and how do we partner together to promote safety. So um, la last question. Um, in your testimony, you outlined several initiatives on increasing the air traffic controller workforce. What strategies are you implementing to bolster other fields in the aviation force, such as aircraft mechanics, pilots, um, uh, other segments of the industry? No, that's, a, <clears throat> that's a great question, and I, I'm, I'm remiss for not mentioning that we're actually hiring in all these sectors. The controllers are sort of the most immediate safety need for us, uh, but we're hiring in all sectors, and we're competing with all those other industries you just mentioned uh, in, in a market that is, is a pretty good market if you're an employee. Uh, so so I, I've often said I'm the chief recruiting officer for, for the agency, so we're doing direct outreach to schools. Uh, we're trying to cast as broad a net as we can to, to interest people into coming into the FAA. And maybe they come in for 30 years or maybe just three years. So we want to make it easier for folks to come through and, and have an experience there and then maybe go do something else afterwards. So uh, it, it is a priority and it's not an, an easy one to, to get after. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, General Lee from Nevada. Uh, Ms. Tiny Swick, nice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, nice to see you, Mr. Whitaker. Congratulations Thank you. on Thank you. having this position. It's, uh, it's going to be a tough job and a tough place, but I know you're up to it, and we appreciate it very Thank much. You. you know, aviation is so important to my district, Las Vegas. We've got a very crowded airspace with the military, with the drones, with the commercial flights, with the uh, general aviation. So this is really critical. And I want to thank you all for your recent investments from the bipartisan infrastructure law. You brought $49 million for the uh, infrastructure grant funding for all the airports in my district. And that, I, that's really helpful and really appreciated for improving runway safety and taxi upgrades. I'd like to go back to the issue of the air traffic controllers. Uh, we know that air travel is increasing, and yet the number of air traffic controllers is not. We, I think you hired 30 last year, including trainees. And, uh, and they're often forced to work overtime six days a week, and that leads to stress and burnout. And uh, would you just say again for the record how you're trying to address that issue? I, I, you've identified all the, the problems that, that I've also identified coming in, and it's, I think, one of our most pressing needs. And I would add to that, it, it takes years to make an air traffic controller. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a long journey. 
Um, it's not an easy job. It's a very rewarding job, but um, we, we, need to, we need to hire as many as we possibly can. So we, we are uh, ensuring that our own process is delivering as many as it can through the academy in Oklahoma City. But we're, we also want to work with universities in the private sector to make sure we're able to pull as many from, from that source as well. Uh, so we've become more flexible with military hires. It used to be twice a year, so if you didn't happen to leave the military at just the right time, you had to wait six months. We now have a, a constant hiring of military controllers, which will increase uh, the number of, of folks who can go directly into the towers or centers. Um, and uh, we're working, I think, uh, one of our most promising outlets will be these uh, aeronautical colleges and universities where the students can get the exact same curriculum as the, as the academy uh, and then go directly into a pass the exam and go directly into a, a tower or radar facility. So going forward, that will allow us to really increase the pipeline. But in the short term, it's gonna be hard to, because it takes so long, it's gonna be hard to move that needle very much, uh, at least till you get about two years out. I think there's a place in some of the community colleges for developing programs like this. That would I, I think that, that, would, that can certainly that could certainly be eligible if they're able to teach that curriculum and have the, the training tools. It often requires being around a lot of retired controllers. They have a relatively early retirement age. A lot of them become instructors afterwards. So, uh, but I, I think I'd, I'd like to really see that program expand as we go forward. Thank you. Yeah, me too. If we can be helpful, let us know. Uh, also, we're seeing more and more in different modes of transportation that companies are acting in ways that tend to prioritize profits over uh, safety. And you mentioned in your testimony that the agency found inspections of the grounded 737-9 MAX aircraft showed Boeing's quality system issues were, and I quote, unacceptable and required further scrutiny. Do you have confidence then your suppliers that they can kind of maintain this quality control? It's not a fox guarding the hen house kind of situation? Well, I, I think we're looking, we're gonna look at this process really top to bottom to see, see where the incentives are, where the failures are in the system. Uh, and we're gonna demand that that quality come up to the appropriate schedule. We, we, we certify aircraft to be built to very specific specifications and they have to be built to those specifications. So regardless of their uh, other motives, they're, they're not gonna be able to build more airplanes until they meet those standards. Okay. You don't see a problem with conflict of interest with self inspections? We are looking at that specifically. We've asked MITRE, our research uh, firm, to uh, give us options on delegation and, and where we might bring in a third party, for example, in quality control or quality assurance to make sure you have a, a neutral set of eyes on some of those issues. So that is something we're looking at. Okay, and then just in a second to throw out there about the framework for beyond line of sight. Now it's based on a waiver system. We wanna put those rules in place. Are you moving forward with that? We're, we're, gonna, we're gonna move as quickly as we can on that one. Okay, yes. I, a lot of people want you to move a little more I, quickly. I've been getting that message, thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Titus. Uh, General from Utah, Mr. Owens, recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, on behalf of the Westerners, uh, Utah is a remarkable place that, of, of uh, conversions and uh, connections. Uh, fastest growing state in the union right now. We have the Olympics possibly, inland ports. Uh, so it's gonna be very important that, that we have that conduit of, of coming from places, a hub like uh, Utah. That being said, the, the FAA, has, uh, FAA has identified multiple time, time blocks where the DCA airport is currently under, underutilized. Do you believe more flights can be added safely and efficiently uh, to that process? So, so uh, our, our focus on, with respect to DCA is, is whether it's safe. So uh, we're, we're not involved in the, in the decision around where the flights can go from DCA. Uh, so our, our, our focus is entirely on, on the safety aspect. Uh, it is an airport that is very close to capacity. There are some hours when there's some room for new capacity, uh, but it is, as you know, a, a pretty full operations. It tends to operate at around 60 operations a minute. I mean, an hour, sorry. So it's basically one, one a minute. So you can't really squeeze much more than that in there. So that that's, tends to be where our focus is. Well, according to some of the reports I got, we got from the FAA, it is a safe, it is, there are blocks in which it can be effectively done safely according to the FAA report. Well, we will always make sure it's operating safely. Okay. If something suffers, it'll be, it'll be efficiency. Okay. Um, 
Outside the perimeter are tens of millions of Americans who deserve better pricing, better value, and more convenient access to DC representatives. I encourage and support the efforts to provide a consumer free market uh, to our nation's capital. I would really appreciate that. Uh, in my, my hometown airport, uh, Salt Lake City, is currently phase two of a three part, $5 billion development. Can you explain the impact of the delayed FAA uh, reauthorization to Salt Lake City at international and airports like that are going through, uh, going through modernization? Well, yes, I think you're hitting on a, a very important point. These projects uh, have a certain momentum and they need to be funded and they need to operate under, uh, under current authorization. So I think it's, it's vital that both of those pieces happen. Okay, I'm going to yield my, my remaining time to my good friend from Texas. Mr. Thank you, and I apologize, Mr. Administrator. They, these wonderful gentlemen give me their time when they don't have anything else to say, and I've got so much to talk about with you. So just for the record here, uh, I asked you, uh, did you write this letter, and you stated you didn't, but you had somebody ask you to write this letter. Can I ask you who asked you to write this letter dated February 5th? Uh, so... I think the discussion probably would have been with our government affairs team mm -hmm. uh, that focuses on providing technical assistance uh, on legislation. But you couldn't specifically, somebody come up to you and said, hey, Mr. Administrator, I'm drafting this letter. I want you to approve this letter so we can send out to Senators Cantwell and Cruz? No, it, it, it comes through a, a correspondence. We put out a lot of correspondence, and the last four weeks I've been mostly busy on other topics. Okay, so it was written by, uh, your opinion, some government affairs team within the FAA. Uh, presumably, but I, I, I don't know precisely, uh -huh. but that normally would be how it would be developed. All right, uh, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, you did state that, I bring this letter up, and you stated that it is not the official position of the FAA to oppose raising the retirement age to 67, but you have some concerns, and in the letter it talks about... Uh, uh, we always prioritize a robust process to identify risk and ensure mitigations to, main safe, to maintain safety, but we do not test in a live environment. We do not test in a live environment. Could you tell us what that means? What are the members up here, what the hell is a live environment? Explain that to me. I think, I, I, I believe what that means is we don't change a rule to see how it plays out. We usually like to do the research before we change a rule. Okay. Uh, would you consider, do you, are you familiar with basic med, basic med, the, stu the study, the basic med safety am, study? Yes. All right. The FAA authorized it. They let it run. They looked at it after three years, like 2017, 2018, 2019, and they reported back to Congress. It's right here. I have it here. An FAA report submitted to Congress as required on March 10th reviewed three years of general aviation data and concluded that the basic med program is safe. Isn't that a live study? I mean, they were flying around. These general aviators are flying around. They're looking at whether it's a, th a third class uh, medical versus a basic med, and they found out that basic med works. That is a live study. Would you agree? Yeah, that was uh, based on a legislative mandate. Yeah. But it, I, that's, I, I know it's a legislative mandate. We don't refuse. That is a live study, though. I mean, come on. How could you right. not agree with that? They're flying around, and they're reporting back three years of data, and they're saying, hey, there's no issues with basic med. That's a live study. Right. Okay. Just want to get that, because it says we do not test in a live environment. That's not true. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Nels. Uh, recognize Mr. Carbajal for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, welcome, Administrator uh, Whitaker. Prior to the Alaska Airlines uh, 1282 accident, did the FAA find any evidence of persistent quality control lapses in any of Boeing's production lines? So <clears throat> recognizing that, that, to answer that question, a lot of that is before my uh, tenure, uh, but I think the production problems uh, with the 787 beginning in 2019 uh, through through recently are, are pretty well known. Um, and even just in December, we had uh, uh, an airworthiness directive around a loose bolt on a rudder system. Uh, so I think there, there were already some, some recent reports of production issues uh, with Boeing. Not to hammer on that, but uh, you did mention some bolt issues recently. Has the FAA become aware of any other lapses uh, since the start of the investigation? 
So the, the investigation is, is ongoing and, uh, and we're supporting uh, NTSB in their investigation, of course, of the incident itself. Um, so there's no, there, there are no findings really to discuss at this point. Um, the audit investigation is going on and the only thing I can say about that, it, it, hasn't determined, it hasn't shown any findings that have led us to immediate action. So we're, we're just gonna take the data we get from that and analyze that to decide how to move forward. Thank you. Mr. Whitaker, one of the FAA's most successful government industry partnerships is the Contract Tower Program. 262 smaller airports participate in this critically important air traffic safety program, including 21 in California, one of which is in my district, the San Luis Obispo County Airport. This critical air traffic safety program is important to maintain and develop regional service and supports DOD flight training operations and military readiness as a pilot flight schools all across the country. It is also important to note that contract towers account for approximately one third of all tower operations in the nation and about 70% of contract controllers are veterans. Uh, Mr. Administrator, what assurances can you give me and my colleagues that contract towers will remain a priority for you? Uh, <clears throat> well, I can assure you that we, we certainly support the program and given the, the uh, hiring challenges we're having with air traffic controllers, no, no incentive to try to tinker with the system as it's working. Uh, and in fact, we, we also do hiring from contract towers uh, as well, so it's a source for our own controllers. So uh, we're for fully supportive of, of the program and, and want to make sure it's working, particularly in smaller airports. Great. Also, staffing shortages continue to be a challenge throughout the industry, which you just now touched on, including contract towers. What measures can the FAA and the industry undertake collaboratively to address staffing challenges at these towers? I think, um, I think we're doing all that we can do from, from, from our, that we've been able to think of for our own hiring purposes. Um, but I think, you know, it's become a very competitive market. There are a lot of new entrants in different aspects of aerospace. So I think we just have to really compete for those employees and, and give them a good working environment. Thank you. I appreciate uh, your leadership. I appreciate um, you recently um, becoming the administrator, and I think you have your hands full with a lot of challenges, but I think you're the right person for the job, and I just wanted to recognize you for all that you bring to the table to this very important position um, and all the problem solving that you're gonna help us achieve. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Carvajal. Uh, recognize the gentlelady from Oregon, Ms. chavez Reamer. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, nice to meet you, sir. Nice to meet you. Uh, I represent Oregon's 5th Congressional District, and I'm grateful to be on this committee to ask these questions. So I'll get right started. Uh, long delays and cancellations have become too common in airports, in large part due to the shortage of pilots. It would be ridiculous for us to look at the current state of things and say, everything is fine. Let's just keep the status quo. Last week, through my work on Education and Workforce Committee, the Flight Education Access Act was included in major student loan reform package. This is a huge step in resolving that shortage. The common sense proposal closes the pilot workforce gap by letting prospective pilots access the same loan opportunities available to students at traditional four-year schools. It increases the total maximum amount of the federal direct and subsidized Stafford loans and eligible dependent may borrow to $11,000, increases the maximum amount for independent students to $137,000, $500 and increases the maximum amount of federal direct Stafford loans to a total of $65,000. Mr. Administrator, if prospective pilots could access these types of student loans and use them when completing the FAA's regulated training, would that help improve the pilot shortage? I, I think that would be a very useful initiative. It's, it, is, it is very expensive to become a, uh, an airline pilot, uh, which means 1,500 hours. So you can become a private pilot with as few as 40 hours. So getting from 40 to 1500 is a hugely expensive uh, endeavor. So it's, it's like any other profession, uh, doctor, lawyer, plumber, uh, it, you know, you, it, it costs money to get there. And, um, and so I you think would agree would it's useful. a positive outcome. Absolutely. This would be a positive initiative a to move forward. 
So moving on, uh, what should be the most common part of air travel safety? Of course, you've heard plenty about the Boeing Alaska accident today and amongst others, uh, but it is not lost on me is that it happened in Oregon, my home state. Uh, Oregonians, we choose Alaska Airlines as their preferred airline, and I fly on them every single week uh, back and forth. Uh, Boeing jets rightfully have cause for concern and many questions. Can you speak to the level of confidence uh, uh, once again today in the FAA-approved inspection steps for the 737-9 MAX door plug? Yes, I think that that was a very thorough inspection process, and the, uh, the mechanical fix to that defect, uh, we have a high level of confidence that takes care of the problem. Uh, and so you'd fly on the 737-9 MAX? Yes, I would. Uh, Congressman Carbajal uh, kind of uh, talked on my last question on the contract tower program, and I have one of those in my district in Bend. So uh, I appreciate you answering uh, that you are in full support of continuing that. Um, so I will uh, yield my time then to my colleague, uh, Mr. Nels, the remaining time. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Administrator, obviously uh, this letter that you did not write, but you had uh, the government uh, affairs team write, I believe. And you know, listen, you're a busy man. I don't think maybe you proofread this thing very clearly. I mean, there's some issues here as it relates to the, but we do not test in a live environment. I believe my, that basic med uh, safety study is a prime example, and I, and I have a few more, I believe, uh, that... Uh, it's interesting, ALPA is taking dues from pilots in Canada over the age of 65. ALPA is taking dues from pilots over the age of 65, and we know ALPA doesn't, they want to squash this. They don't want this retirement age rage. WestJet is flying ALPA-represented pilots over the age of 65 right now. That is your live study, Mr. Administrator. That is your live study. Let's talk about the, one, the Part 135 operators. We allow pilots to fly over the age of 65 under Part 135. Is that not a live environment? Could you explain to everybody up here what a Part 135 is versus a 121? Uh, <clears throat> a Part uh, 135 carry is a carrier typically under 30 passengers. Uh, sure. Or less, yeah. uh, net jets would be an example? That's correct. All right. Do Part 121 and 135 share the same airspace? They do. They do. So they taxi with Part 121 i.e. the big airliners, folks, Delta, United, everything, and you can get this net jet. Taylor Swift flying to the Super Bowl in her supersonic jet. They could be in the same airspace, taxiing on the same runway. Why do Part 135 that flies around the millionaires and the billionaires across the country, why can they fly to the age 67, but United and Delta, that gentleman, we fire him at 65? How does that make any sense? Congress passed a law limiting them to 65? Congress passed a law limiting them to 65. Right. And how do you feel about that? Do you think that's just, it's right? I, I, I think it's what Congress did, so we don't second guess Congress. Well, I think our point was if you're going to change it, we'd like to have some data around that. I, I think that's perfect. When they, I yield back. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, for the record, I'm not sure that Taylor Swift flies supersonic. Just want to make note. Uh, gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Oshenklaus, recognized. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, I want to second what the Chairman said about the imperative for the Senate to pass the FAA reauthorization. This committee did good work, bipartisan work, and it needs to happen in the Senate now. Uh, Mr. Whitaker, you were earlier getting questions from my Republican colleagues about migrant housing at the airports. Uh, by statute, FAA has jurisdiction over airside, not landside operations at airports, correct? That's correct, sir. And there is one instance of the air side of an airport asking to house migrants, correct? That's my understanding. And there has been no documentation of air side safety being impeded at that one airport, JFK, correct? That, that, is, that is the standard, yes. And is the FAA an aeronautical safety organization or is it an immigration agency? Our mission is safety, sir. The hardworking men and women of Border Patrol, which actually is this government's immigration agency, have endorsed the Senate's bipartisan deal on border security, which is a tough and fair compromise to address the migrant surge. And if my Republican colleagues are so concerned about solving this problem, I suggest that they stop asking you, sir, for answers and start asking Speaker Johnson for answers. And question number one might be, are you Donald Trump's campaign manager or are you Speaker of the House? Sir, back to your job. 
you authorized the MAX airplane to fly again after the Alaska Airlines accident. Why do you believe the MAX airplane is now safe? So the, the MAX 9 was grounded because of uh, concerns about the quality of manufacturing for the plug door. So the focus of that uh, airworthiness directive was to uh, inspect those aircraft and come up with a repair that would ensure that it met the uh, standard of safety built into the certification of the aircraft. Uh, once that inspection and repair uh, scenario was, was agreed upon, then the aircraft was allowed to return to service. Now in 2020, you took back, not you, but the FAA took back airworthiness ticketing from Boeing. What did that do for oversight of Boeing then, and was that oversight sufficient given the problems it has had at factories regarding the MAX 9? So I wasn't, I wasn't there at the, at the time, as you noted. Uh, I guess I would say in retrospect, and given what happened with the plug door, it's hard to call that oversight sufficient. So we're looking at that process and, and what additional steps need to be taken to make sure that that oversight is sufficient. Last August, the FAA announced almost $45 million in funding for Boston Logan International Airport to simplify the airfield layout and reduce the risk of runway incursions. Can you speak to how investments like that will improve passenger safety and any other work the FAA is doing to reduce the risk of near misses? So, so uh, issues that happen on, in the airport environment and on runways, uh, each, each, uh, each airport is unique. It has its own geometry, and certain geometries create natural situations that can cause uh, confusion. So trying to, uh, and we call them hotspots, uh, trying to identify those hotspots and correct them, either through signage, lighting, uh, or, or sometimes moving taxiways is highly effective in keeping them safer. So uh, the good news about these type of events is there are, there are really straightforward solutions and we've been deploying those solutions. Uh, I wanna join my colleagues in saying how happy we are to have you in this position, how qualified I think you are for this job and uh, looking forward to seeing the work that you can do for uh, maintaining and, and, and improving America's gold standard reputation for airline safety. Thank you. Yield sir. back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Auchincloss. Uh, recognize the Vice Chair of the Subcommittee, the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Yakin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Administrator Whitaker, for being here today. After a robust, open, and transparent and bipartisan process, the House passed its FAA reauthorization last July in an overwhelming 351 to 69 vote. And it, and it appears we're finally going to see some welcome movement from our colleagues in the Senate later on this week. Hopefully that means we can soon provide certainty and stability to your agency, to the aviation community, and to the flying public with an FAA reauthorization centered around our gold standard of safety and continued American aviation leadership. But it's that leadership I'd like to speak about today, or in this particular case, the lack thereof. As we held hearings in the lead up to our FAA reauthorization bill, we heard from witnesses, especially in the drone delivery industry, who said that they were expanding in markets like Australia instead of the United States due to a lack of regulatory certainty. I've been encouraged to see the FAA in recent months issuing a number of Part 107 waiver, waivers that enable beyond visual line of sight operations for drone delivery companies. The waivers represent another step in a long journey that must strike that fine balance between safety and forward momentum. But it's a journey that, in my estimation, has been moving far too slow. Mr. Whitaker, early, earlier you told my colleague, Chairman Graves, that the BB loss notice of proposed rulemaking will be published, quote, this year. Last September, an FAA official had pegged that timeline at August of 2024. Is that timeline slipping, or is August still the goal? I can look, and if you'd like, I'll give you a specific answer. I was covering for my lack of memory on an exact date, so. Yeah, I would like a specific answer, if you don't no. mind. I'll, I'll just circle back with you. I will give you a precise answer. I just don't recall. Great. I would like yep. a precise answer on that. And, and, yep. and furthermore, if, if the timeline from August, which was told to, uh, or an FAA administrator told or official told uh, back in September, if that timeline from August is slipping, I would like to have you circle back and articulate why within the FAA that timeline is slipping. And then my second question is, once that notice is, is published, 
are you able to commit to publishing a final rule within 12 months of the notice of proposed rulemaking? I can, <clears throat> I can commit to keeping the rule moving as quickly as possible. It depends on what, what comments come in, how they get arbitrated, and then it has to go through a re review process, as you know, uh, up through OIRA. But we will give as much transparency as possible and try to keep that moving as much as possible. I think it's an important rule and we want to get it out. Right. I, I, and I agree with you. It is an important rule and it's one that, due to so many delays and timelines, we have companies who are reevaluating their uh, innovation, their R&D right here in the United States. We want companies to continue to make those investments here in the United States. I so agree. Yes. Thank you for your commitment yep. to moving forward. And uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to yield the, the balance of my time to uh, my colleague, Mr. Nels. Thank you, sir. Sure, um, Nels. So we've talked about this letter. We've talked about uh, the fact that I don't believe it was proofread, sir. I really don't. I, I, you seem to be a great guy. I think you have a bright future. But this letter is full of inaccuracies. It has flaws. It says we don't test in a live environment, but I don't believe you believe that. I just think that that's not what you believe, and I think we can point that out. We, um, the last sentence of the letter, it says, quote, it is critical to provide the agency an opportunity to conduct research and determine mitigations. You talk about conducting research. Everybody that's listening, watching, Japan, New Zealand, Australia, our friends to the north, Canada, all have pilots above the age of 67. They've had no safety issues. Zero, no safety issues. The head of the FAA in New Zealand, I went up to ICAO, I flew up to Canada, went to the ICAO meeting. The FAA administrator of New Zealand said they have pilots flying up the age of 75 and they have no issues. That's your live study, sir. Call them, ask them. I even got, believe it or not, John Prater, the former president of Airline Pilots Association, it says, in the past, reference 60 to 65, in the past, commercial airline pilots who did not want to stop working at age 60 took jobs with international airlines or charter operators for which the retirement age was higher. The experience of these pilots should also be studied, said John Prater, president of ALPA. Quote, you can look globally, look at Canada, and look at pilots flying in corporate aviation and on-demand services like net jets. He says, referring to a large private aviation, the GAO could expand and ask the airlines themselves. That's the avenue they could investigate if they choose to expand their look, end quote. I yield. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, recognize, recognize the gentleman uh, from Texas, Mr. Elwood. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, it's an incredibly important topic at an important time. And thank you, Mr. Administrator, for being here. I know that we're all united uh, in wanting to restore confidence uh, in our air travel. You know, when we have some Americans out, uh, you know, travel quite a bit, as, as we all do, and I was sitting next to fo some folks the other day who were saying that they were filtering out in their travel plans uh, the planes that they think are unsafe. And when we have that, uh, we know that we have to respond. Uh, and so we have to respond together. Uh, here on our responsibility is to help you uh, to ensure that we remain the gold standard. And I'm, you certainly have my commitment on that. And I wanted to just ask you about, in reference to Boeing's internal oversight, you say that it's time to uh, re-examine the delegation of authority and assess any associated safety risks. Can you discuss how the FAA intends to change oversight at the manufacturing sites uh, to meet this goal? So what we're, what we're doing, uh, we're doing a number of things. We're doing an audit of the manufacturing process we are looking into what is delegated, what could be overseen by a third party. Um, and we have inspectors on the ground talking to employees to understand sort of the ground truth, if you will, of what's happening, what the pressures are. Um, and based on that outcome, we will look at putting together a program to continue to add uh, direct oversight to what otherwise was sort of an auditing approach. So a much more hands-on approach going forward. That'll be, that'll be really designed after this six-week audit period is, is finished and we have a better understanding of what's going on in the factory. And do you need any further authorizations or support from the Congress in order to do that? Is there anything in the uh, FAA reauthorization that would assist in that? Well, I, I do appreciate you saying that the willingness to work together. I do think with a, a problem like this, we all need to be rowing in the same direction. Congress, Boeing, the airlines, uh, the FAA. I think we all want the same outcome, which is safe airplanes. Um, so we, we will certainly come back with you on that. I think we do anticipate needing to hire more inspectors 
Uh, the oversight before was a different skill set, and we need folks who are trained to be on the ground and, and much more hands-on. Uh, so we do anticipate some hiring. I think we have the authorizing authority to do that. We may need to find the money to do it, but I think that'll be a top priority, and we'll, we'll either come, come back for that or we'll make it work one way or the other. Because there's an inherent tension here uh, between uh, you know, competition, the need to you know, rush products to market. Um, I remember back when we dealt with the Max initially, a few years back, some of the internal discussions about needing to compete uh, when you're also your own regulator or your own uh, doing your own internal reviews. Uh, and so it seems to me that we have to have uh, more on our side in terms of independent investigators. Uh, and I recognize the, the cost associated with that, but I think that uh, for the uh, American flying public, it's a cost that's worth us bearing in terms of making sure that we don't have another incident like what we had. Uh, and so uh, in order to have uh, a truly safe system, it seems to me that we can't rely on uh, our, the manufacturers them, themselves to be their own um, you know, watchdogs. Is that something you would agree with? I, I certainly agree that, that what's the, the current system is not working because it's not delivering safe aircraft. So we have to make some changes to that. And I think we also have to look at the culture. Uh, to your point, incentives drive behavior. And I think maybe the, we need to look at the incentives uh, to make sure safety is getting the appropriate uh, first rung of consideration that it deserves. Yeah. I mean, I played in the NFL, and if, uh, if they'd let us be our own referee, if they'd let us be our own referees, <laughs> You know, I, I, every, every time an offensive lineman tried to block me, it would have been a holding call. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I think this is cer certainly something we should work on. I, I wanted to come really quickly to uh, the announcement that you just issued about the installation of the first modernized tower simulation uh, system for traffic control or training uh, in my state, uh, Austin Bergstrom Air International Airport. Uh, can you elaborate how this technology will benefit our controller workforce that's already stretched so thin? So the, the, these simulators, they're, they, they're in a way a simple technology. It's, it's a circle of screens that really reproduces the, the environment of that particular airport and allows controllers to train on that, on, on that environment. So that works for new controllers, but also if you have a system, if you have a problem at your airport, for example, a hotspot area, or some other persistent problem that we've identified, existing controllers can actually train to that problem in that simulator, so it can be it can be thrown at them as a situation to see how they respond and, and becomes a, a learning tool. So it's really important for current training, uh, but also for helping move controllers fast through the yeah. through the training process. That's great. Well, thank you so much. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allred. Uh, recognize gentleman from New York, Mr. Molinero. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Whitaker. Uh, we, we welcome your leadership. It goes without question. Uh, the FAA, uh, in at least my estimation and many others, has uh, been in need of, uh, of leadership and, and uh, certainly um, reauthoriz FAA reauthorization, critically important. We're hopeful uh, the Senate moves uh, earnestly and that uh, we can uh, move that uh, bill uh, to law. Uh, without uh, uh, question, Americans have uh, witnessed too many alarming uh, incidents from aircraft employee treatment. Uh, to aircraft safety and passenger experience. I appreciated participating in the briefing last week uh, regarding the door plug incident and look forward, obviously, to the NTSB report and, and FAA's reaction and response. Uh, on the topic of safety, I, I was very happy to see in your testimony a reference uh, FAA rulemaking on drug and alcohol testing for foreign repair stations. Uh, one of the first bills I introduced uh, was the Global Aircraft Maintenance Safety Improvement. Uh, Act, which uh, ensures parity of safety protocols between domestic and foreign aircraft maintenance we are familiar with. I'm very happy to say uh, this provision has been uh, included in the House passed FAA reauthorization, uh, and I'm hopeful uh, that uh, it will remain a part of final law. Uh, in the area of, in particular, uh, both uh, treatment of um, uh, aircraft employees and passenger experience, uh, supporting mental health and breaking down barriers is a top priority of many of ours. Uh, it's why I joined. Chairman uh, Graves, Garrett Graves, and urging the FAA to modernize its mental health protocols and take immediate steps to dismantle barriers that discourage individuals from seeking care. I do appreciate in your testimony that you referenced the FAA's Mental Health and Aviation Medical Class Aviation Rulemaking Committee. Uh, I certainly, uh, as do others, urge swift release of the report uh, that comes from that committee uh, and ask, sir, for your commitment uh, here today uh, in supporting uh, making mental health and the treatment, uh, in particular, of uh, aircraft employees a top priority within FAA's uh, regula regulatory environment. Yes, sir, it is, a, it is a top priority, and I think it's 
uh, long overdue to, me to update the, the approach to mental health and just treat these as health issues and, and have a, a clear path to, to treatment and, and get people back in the cockpit uh, as quickly as possible. Yeah, we certainly acknowledge the rise in mental health concerns across America. They are made even uh, more dangerous uh, uh, in confined environments like aircraft, and certainly men and women who are flying or participate uh, in uh, keeping us safe uh, in, that, in, in that arena deserve uh, adequate care. Um, uh, so I certainly look forward to the progress and urge uh, swift action. Um, uh, another question uh, that I just wanted to touch on uh, as it relates to uh, advanced air mobility, a topic that uh, we all have focused on pretty acutely. Uh, can you provide us a timing on the power, powered lift uh, as far um, as, far as uh, you know, the FA committed, as far as I know, the committed to completing it in 2024? I'm certainly interested, as in others, uh, in hearing your insights and hearing what stage of development uh, the SFAR is in. So that, that rule is under development, and we do expect a, a final rule by the end of the year. All right. uh, thank you, Mr. Whitaker. I want to reinforce uh, my uh, uh, support of your efforts. Um, I, uh, in response to a comment uh, and question from my colleague from Massachusetts, I just would note uh, the FAA, when it desires to, has a great deal of influence on landside activity at airports. Having managed one, I know that firsthand. Uh, and, and certainly when, when there needs to be uh, FAA clarity, I, I encourage it. Uh, and with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield the balance of my time to Mr. Nelson. Thank you again, sir. Uh, in the letter again, it is critical to provide the agency an opportunity to conduct research and determine mitigations. We talk about the research. I mentioned to you, sir, uh, and thank you for being here. I mentioned you, Japan, New Zealand, Australia, Canada. They are all operating with pilots over the age of 67. Do you think it would be a good idea to maybe reach out to those countries and ask them, hey, how's it working for you, Canada to the north? I mean, any issues with this? I mean, we're all human beings. Any issues? Do you think that would be maybe a, a good idea to try to help accomplish what you ask for in this letter to conduct research and determine mitigations? Uh, certainly, if the, if the legislation is passed, we will look at that option. Yes, I think it's very, very important because it's all there for you. I, I mentioned, I talk a little bit about the 135s, right? These, these part 135 operators that are flying the millionaires and billionaires I, a lot of people can't fly that in this room here. They're flying around the, the millionaires and the billionaires, and those pilots can be 67 years old. And the FAA is okay with that, correct? I mean, it's, they can fly 67 years old and fly the millionaires and billionaires in the same airspace. And Brosey argued with me on that one. The output president said, oh, no, they don't fly, operate in the same. He's, he's not being truthful. They fly in the same airspace. You would agree with that? Do I agree that they fly in the air, same airspace? Yes. They do, yes. So how can we allow pilots to be 67 to fly the millionaires and the billionaires, but not allow Delta, United, and American to do it when we know we have a pilot shortage? Well, we, we don't set these age limits. The Congress does that. I know it. We're going to fix it. We're going to fix it today. Thank you, Sheriff. Uh, recognize the patient gentlelady from California, Ms. Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that. Um, welcome, Mr. Administrator. Thank you for being here. Uh, last week, we learned uh, again about uh, Spirit Aerospace, and uh, the, they incorrectly drilled holes in the fuselage. Um, I'm, I'm wondering uh, if you know, at this point in time, has FAA determined how many aircraft uh, were delivered to customers with these problems, and what actions are being taken? to address this newest problem with Boeing and its supplier? So the, the, we're working with uh, Boeing to understand what, what, the, what, what happened here, and so we're investigating that piece of it. Um, these are uh, ri uh, ri small rivets that hold a window in place. So we're, uh, likely what that means is it's, well, we, we know it's not to compliance, so we want to understand why it has not been uh, manufactured or design, uh, and then we'll see what, what uh, corrective actions need to be take to repair the windows and when that has to happen. I'm, I'm talking about incorrectly drilled in the fuselage, that they had drilled holes that were too close to the edge? Yeah, those, those were around a window holding. Oh, they were, okay. Yeah, in, in, the, in the fuselage. Okay, very good, very good. Um, so um, the... House uh, FAA reauthorization bill uh, would create a new deputy administrator for sa safety and operations uh, to engage in the certification and operational approval of 
life-saving technologies. Can you share your thoughts on how technology will improve avia aviation safety and how you would use the new uh, deputy administrator role to further advance technologies? I think, um, I think that technology has been uh, one of the great tools that we've had to reduce the accident rate in aviation. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of benefit in expanding what's available, uh, particularly into GA aircraft, uh, to pro provide more situational awareness in the cockpit. Um, I think the focus needs to be looking at ways to bring that kind of technology to market as quickly as possible, recognizing the positive impact that it has on safety. So I can see that role being uh, helping to facilitate that action. So the deputy administrator would be really responsible to trying to really prioritize this within the, within the organization? Uh, I, I think we always want to prioritize safety, um, but it would be a, a, an additional resource to, to have perhaps qu quicker implementation. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, the FAA and uh, PASS, the Professional Aviation Safety Specialists, uh, have been in collective bargaining for over two years now. What, what's the status of that? Um, my understanding is that the vast majority of uh, terms have been agreed. There are, as happens in these types of things, a handful that are still outstanding. Uh, we're committed to, to working as quickly as possible to kind of to try to get to final resolution. I understand that following the January 24th FAA approval of the 737 MAX 9 inspection plans, both Alaska and United began to return aircraft to service. Do you know how many aircraft remain to be inspected, and have you heard from these airlines what their total estimated losses have been since the original grounding? Um, I don't have any information on the financial impact of this. Uh, I'm sure they're dealing directly with Boeing. Uh, as far as the uh, number of aircraft returned to service, I think it's been about 90% so far. I don't have a precise number, but most of them have been returned to service. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. You didn't want to yield your time to the gentleman from Texas? No. Uh, I thought about it, but I thought I would pass. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Bradley. I uh, recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Kane. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And I would like to thank Administrator Whitaker being here today. Runway safety is a critical aspect of aviation. And many runway instances and near misses have been reported over the past year, and you outlined in your testimony the actions the FAA has taken to address these risks. What are some of the challenges you still face in addressing such safety risks? I think we don't, we don't have a lot of direct barriers other than sort of capacity of manpower. So we've, we've, we've dispatched uh, runway safety teams to, to virtually every major airport in the country to review the geometry of the airport and to assess what technologies uh, might be helpful, whether it's as simple as lightings and, or signs or a more complex uh, uh, surface awareness uh, technology. It's this, the surface awareness technology in the in the tower that's the most helpful, and I think that's uh, sort of the long pole in the tent at this point. Okay. How is the FAA addressing workforce challenges, particularly in terms of acquiring and maintaining the expertise necessary for certifying new technologies, such as unmanned aircraft systems and advancing air mobility technology? So these new technologies do present challenges for us on the certification side. Uh, there are a lot of new systems, a lot of new uh, capabilities that are, are new to aviation. So uh, bringing in the right workforce to work those issues is an ongoing challenge. We're competing with all these companies out there that are developing those technologies. Uh, but we're, we're, um, we're working to make sure we have those resources in place. Um, what is the FAA doing to ensure that the agency is ready to fully implement the FAA reauthorization uh, legislation, which the Senate has yet to act on uh, when it is signed to the President and enacted into law. Are you doing anything to anticipate the reauthorization in-house? Are you talking about the new legislation yes. coming in? So when, when, when that reg, <coughs> legislation is complete, we, we have a process that will run to identify the, the, the projects for us that come out of that and set up a, a sort of a program management approach so that we are tracking those, trying to meet the deadlines. And uh, if, if, if the deadlines are not achievable, communicating that as quickly as possible. But I think the, the key will be open communication 
uh, with I, the committee. I, I, if I may, I would recommend there's got to be broad agreement, in, as you can see in this administration, must be able to see between what this committee and this chamber, as well as what the Senate is looking at, that you can anticipate what's coming in a number of areas. Right. So I would anticipate, if I may, if you can also look, anticipate some of this efforts. Yes, sir. And with that, I will yield the remainder of my time to Mr. Nels from Texas. Uh, thank thank you. you, sir. In your early testimony, you talked about you established an, I think it was an independent safety review team for the Boeing situation. Is that correct? To look at Boeing? There was an independent safety review team established last year before I came um, in response to near, near misses. Sure. And they put out a report in uh, November. Mm -hmm. And I'm all about safety. I know you are. Everybody in America wants to have, we got the greatest aviation. I mean, our reputation is rock solid. We are safe. We have done a very good job in this country as it relates to aviation safety. Could you consider asking a group like that to go review some of the records from Japan, New Zealand, Canada, to, to, to look at it? I mean, it's a safety review team. Get the records. Ask them, hey, tell us a little bit about your, your history over here and, and your programs and having these pilots at 67 flying around up to 70. How's it working out? Don't you think that would be very useful information, not only for Congress here, but for the FAA, the administrator specifically? Uh, if, if that legislation is, is, does raise the, the age, we will certainly look at all the tools available. Us. Absolutely, and I, I think that's fantastic, even with the, like the, the Part 135s. I mean, are you aware of any issues related to like Part 135s? I mean, has your office received phone calls about potential issues related to all the 135 operators that are flying right now while we're having this conversation? Uh, you get all the data, don't you? I mean, are you a receptacle of a lot of the, the complaints and the data safety regulations as it relates to Part 135? We, we would certainly look at that data as part yeah. of that. Uh, up to, up to, uh, do you feel, that, I mean, are you aware of any issues with these pilots flying around in the same airspace as Conton or Delta at, at, at age 67 with the Part 135? I, I have not looked at the data to see if there are any, any issues around that. I think. Uh, I, I yield back. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff. <clears throat> um, I'm taking a moment of personal privilege here. Um, uh, Stafford to my right keeps screwing up this list. I've had enough of this, and so uh, we're going to go ahead and fire him. Um, <laughs> uh, seriously, uh, to my right is, is uh, Chris Sen, who, who has um, served in our military, uh, got a, a master's in in aviation, a new interest in the market, uh, has a law degree and has been an incredible asset uh, to this committee as we've gone through and built this, um, this near perfect aviation bill. Um, I think this is gonna be the last subcommittee action this week and I just wanna take a minute. Um, he's gonna be taken off at the beginning of next month and I just wanna thank him uh, for his dedicated service working in a bipartisan manner with, um, with, with the entire aviation team um, and I'll say it again, has just been a, a tremendous asset uh, to the committee and uh, really do appreciate uh, his service. So. But I, I did want to fire him before he was able to resign. So, uh, um, uh, so uh, Chris, thank you very much. Really do appreciate your service and friendship and good luck. Um, with that, I uh, recognize a gentleman from California, uh, Mr. Rosalia, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> I'd like to add my my thanks to the to your staff. I also want to right at the beginning say to Mr. Nels, I'm too old to yield any time to you, so you're not going to get any of my time. Um, Mr. Administrator, you have uh, a long, illustrious career, and I, I agree with many of the comments, but you've seen this industry, um, your organization and the industry regulates both the manufacturers and the airline companies. Clearly, the world has changed, and I, I worry, you mentioned this in your opening statements, it's the near misses, it's the manufacturing problems, it's NOTAMs, uh, it's runway incursions. All of those things to me send bright red warning signs. And what I hear from you so far is you accept that, not to be Pollyannish, but we can't, can't rest on our laurels. And I'm afraid in many of these hearings prior to you getting your position, my sense is that the, that the FAA was resting on its previous track record. And quite frankly, your organization reminds me of NASA just before the Challenger disaster and the observation by uh, the commission that institutional deviation, but with you, it's writ large into the culture. So that is a comment 
the safety culture of these companies. Um, the perfect storm to me is this long, wonderful relationship between the Department of Defense, the military, and aviation, both contractually and manufacturing and supplying workforce. Uh, and then this changing. At the same time, we have issues around climate change, um, and we're coming out of COVID. Uh, Airbus and Boeing, they had great profits after consolidation, and now Boeing has, is losing money. Airbus is close to losing money. Um, similarly, in your conversations with the air carriers, the commercial air carriers, enormous pressure. Warren Buffett had a great line about investing in airlines. He said, I have an 800 number. I call at 3 in the morning to say, this is Warren Buffett. I'm afraid I'm going to invest in air stocks again. Please talk me out of it. But he still did it. So the safety culture versus the risk assessment from the details of, in the FAA reauthorization, one of the parts that we put in there, in the case of Alaska, the root cause can go back and find out who actually worked on that plane, what hours they worked on. Um, I'm told Airbus has that information when they do it. So those simple things from the safety culture writ large, I would like your response. And as you talk to the CEOs who are under enormous pressure coming out of COVID, when we kept them in business and with ridership going up to make, to avoid losses in, a, in an investment market that can move very quickly away from them that would create greater damage. And then on top of that, you've got Boeing that's not going to be able to supply the product that they're contra contractually um, already into and have serious financial um, disadvantage to, to delay that too long. So that's a long question about safety culture. How do you maintain a safety culture or return to that safety culture that we used to have and I think we've lost and we're one disaster away from the industry uh, imploding? Uh, thank you for the question. It, um, I, I think you've hit on some, some, some really true points. Um, I, I have been reemphasizing uh, since I've been at the agency that we can't rest on our laurels. We have to be ever vigilant to look for uh, risks in the system, and that's been the focus for the past three months. Um, and safety, culture and safety is, is really important, uh, and I, it's one of the things we're going to be looking at with Boeing. We've got a, a safety uh, culture review that was commissioned as part of the CERT reform legislation that's going to be complete later this month. Uh, and I think that will be informative. Um, but at the end of the day, the goal is, is to make safe airplanes. And I don't think if you don't have that safety culture, I think it's hard to make safe airplanes. So um, we're going to be very focused on, on, that, on, the, on the quality process um, and, and really looking at wherever the data takes us as we do this audit. Uh, we have to get back to a culture where safety is first. I don't care what's second, but safety has to be first. And um, that's where we need to get. And on the operational side, on the notums of the near misses, same thing. I've talked to pilots who uh, really express in air traffic controllers that we're pushing a lot of product from pressure from the operators. Yeah, that's right. And I think from, in my realm, controllers was the, one of the first orders of business. It's a lot of folks working overtime um, and uh, have been doing so for years. And that's not a sustainable thing in my view. So hiring as many controllers as we can and uh, looking at fatigue as a, as a risk that needs to be mitigated is, is our approach there. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. I now rec recognize myself uh, for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Administrator, I want to thank you for being here today. Uh, and I know that it was touched upon by a couple of my colleagues already, but uh, I have some further questions. Um, 92 days ago, you were copied on a letter that was sent to the Transportation Secretary um, by members not only of this committee uh, and other committees, but by the chairman of the subcommittee, the chairman of the full committee, and 68 other members of the House. The letter asked very straightforward questions about the Biden administration's plan to house illegal immigrants and migrants at FAA sites uh, and airports, some of our largest transportation hubs in this nation, uh, including one that's just blocks away from my district at JFK Airport. We requested a response by November 20th, 2023. Uh, today is February 6th, 2024, uh, and we haven't gotten any response. So I'd like to uh, submit the letter for the record again, signed uh, by 68 other members of the House sent 92 days ago. 
And since we haven't heard back, I'd like to pose the questions from the letter to you right now. How many and which airports regulated by the FAA currently host temporary or permanent shelters for illegal immigrants or other persons? I don't, I don't have any information about that. Okay. I also want to point out that probably not mentioned in the letter, and I know wasn't mentioned by my colleagues, I took a visit to JFK Airport just days after this site was apparently approved. Um, I coordinated with Mayor Adams' office. I coordinated with uh, the Port Authority, uh, TSA. And I spent a career in the NYPD as a detective. And one of the most startling things uh, that I found when I got to JFK Airport was not the fact that the FAA uh, or the City of New York actually had me go all the way to JFK Airport only to tell me that the meeting was canceled and they were not allow going to allow me to tour the facility. But the biggest concern that I have is that there is zero communication uh, amongst agencies at that airport. Nobody knows who's in there. Nobody knows what's going on. I mean, it is a transportation hub, probably one of the largest in the country. And we have people just wandering the streets coming out of this facility. I'm not sure how anyone thought that this was a good idea. Has the FAA received or granted any request from an airport or a local state or federal agency between January 20th, 2021 and today to temporary, temporarily use a facility for purposes of hosting a migrant shelter? I, I don't have direct information. I'm happy to respond uh, after with a response to that. To what extent has DHS consulted with the FAA about the appropriateness of proposing to house migrants at airports? I don't have any direct information about that. If DHS has consulted with the FAA, what has the F been the FAA's response? Again, I have no direct information on this. Committee staff asked in a follow-up email if the FAA could provide a detailed description of any analysis or assessment of the DHS housing plan or any other instance of airport migrant housing that has been conducted by the FAA in accordance with the FAA's safety risk management policy. The decision to approve housing of migrants poses a serious security threat and represents failure of the Biden administration's disastrous border policies. Does the FAA have a plan in place to ensure that any of these sites, even the ones that perhaps you don't know about yet, will no longer be used to house migrants? I, I don't have any information about that. So we have, you're the administrator of the FAA, and you don't have any information on any FAA locations that have housed migrants or could potentially house migrants. To my knowledge, there are no FAA locations that house migrants. To your knowledge, are there any FAA locations that were approved to house migrants? I mean, I don't consider an airport an FAA location. Maybe you're talking about airports. You, you were, the FAA has to approve in order for them to become migrant shelters. We, we approve uh, use, community use agreements, yes. Okay. And, and at no point did the FAA think that perhaps it was a bad idea to house migrants in, in these locations? I, I don't have any information on what FAA was thinking before I got there. Okay. So wh when did you take Reigns as administrator? Uh, end of October. End of October. Okay. So on November 6, 2023 was when the letter was sent. It's now... February 6, 2024, we still haven't received a, a response. Will you commit today in front of this committee that in one month you will respond to the questions that were asked in this letter? One month from today, I will, yes. From one month today. So by March 6th of 2024, we will have an answer to all of the questions. Yes. Thank you very much. I now recognize from New Jersey, Mr. Menendez. Thank you, Chairman. Today, I want to focus on the constant helicopter noise we face in our uh, district, in New Jersey's 8th Congressional District. It's a densely populated urban area. I've heard from countless constituents about helicopters that fly at low altitudes for prolonged periods of time, shaking apartment buildings and disrupting enjoyment of public spaces, such as our urban oasis of Liberty State Park. Residents are also concerned that helicopters have been using new flight paths without input or notice to residents. How does the FAA monitor and enforce helicopter, uh, helicopter altitudes and decibel limits in areas like New Jersey's 8th Congressional District and Liberty State Park? 
So we don't, we don't have direct um, authority over, over noise uh, per se, but what we do have is operating rules for helicopters. So they're required to operate at certain uh, altitudes as they uh, traverse land. Um, but beyond that, it's a, a, they're, they're, they fly routes according to what's available in the airspace. And the monitoring component, um, how do you monitor uh, their altitude? Well, they're, they're, they monitor their own altitude. Uh, we would get reports if there's altitude deviations uh, that could come from a variety of sources, but uh, for all operations in the air, there are certain minimum altitudes to be operated at. Understood. And what can the FAA do to address uh, persistent and burdensome hel helicopter noise? So I think the, the most effective uh, tool that we have found is uh, community meetings uh, sponsored by a government entity, usually an airport, uh, that are open and inclusive, so include not only the immediate affected areas, but also areas surrounding that, so that there's uh, an, an ability to have a community dialogue around solutions. Great, and that's a great segue. Last week I wrote to you highlighting the impact helicopter noise has on the district. My office and the Hudson County Board of Commissioners have received a growing level of complaints and are requesting the opportunity to discuss the issue and potential solutions during a public meeting with your representative uh, from the FAA. I wanna formally invite you to our district to experience this issue firsthand and to work together towards a solution by attending this public meeting with the Hudson County Board of Commissioners. I'd, we'd be happy to have a, a representative participate, uh, provided it's, uh, as I mentioned, a government-sponsored meeting and, and one that includes a very broad community. And I think it's also in, useful to include zoning officials, since some of this is also zoning-related, which sure. we, is outside of our domain as well, sir. Yeah, absolutely. And we would be happy to build a broad coalition of folks yeah. there and different stakeholders to ensure that's a productive meeting for the representative that's able to, to attend. Uh, switching gears, I'm glad that the FAA has taken serious steps to deal with terrible assaults and violent incidents against flight crews, and I commend the agency's efforts in taking on this issue. However, I'm still concerned that assaults against landside employees aren't receiving the same level of response. These workers work directly with customers who are experiencing delays, cancellations, or other complications with their travel. The 2018 FAA reauthorization bill tasked the FAA with implementing employee assault prevention and response plans. Those plans have yet to be put into place, and I've tried to fix this problem through my bill, the Airline Employee Assault Prevention Act. While I'm pleased that the House Pass version included pieces of this bill, the work is far from over. Mr. Whitaker, do you know why these plans haven't been implemented yet? I'm not, I'm not familiar with that specific plan. I do share your concern about uh, obviously assaults on not only flight crew, but in the airport. I think uh, the airport uh, space becomes a little more complicated. You don't have the, the clear authorities and the sort of captive uh, environment. Uh, and um, it, it's unclear, for example, what TSA's involvement might be, what the local police involvement might be, what the airport's involvement. So I think the issue becomes murkier in the airport environment. Um, this issue has been raised to me, and I've had some discussions with airport um, uh, directors a, a about that. So it is, it is an issue of concern. Yeah, and we understand it's a jurisdictional issue, and that's what part of our legislation was meant to address, to ensure that these assault prevention plans cover both the air and land side. And so we want to make sure we work with all partners to ensure that all folks and employees are kept safe, especially sort of as um, some of these travel challenges lead to upset passengers and they have unfortunate impacts. So I look forward to working with you on this issue and uh, appreciate your testimony here today. Thanks Thank so much. You, sir. Uh, yeah, we, we will follow up on that issue with you. Great, thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Benenez, and I recognize Mr. Massey for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Whitaker, I've heard from several aircraft manufacturers and component manufacturers that the certification process at the FAA has become even more long and arduous than normal in a post-COVID era. Some of this they attribute to people not returning to work in the office yet after COVID. Some of it is because there are a lot of new employees who don't have as much familiarity as the more senior employees did who left. What, what are you doing or what do you plan to do to improve this certification process so that U.S. companies can be competitive and improve safety and efficiency for our, our pilots and, and passengers? So it's a, it is a very important issue, and, and we have a number of things that we're looking at doing. One is creating more transparency in the process. So we identify where an application is, why it's not moving. So sometimes it's because we're still waiting for data, or sometimes maybe we have the data and we're not moving fast enough. So we want to get some certainty around that. Um, 
I think there's been a little bit of overcorrection um, following the MAX events, frankly, a little more conservative uh, approach. And, um, and, and I think, you know, having clear leadership and clear process so we can resolve uh, decisions is, is an important part of that. And, and we're looking at ways to do that. It, it's an important issue and one we're working on. There's another area of efficiency that uh, I've heard from people that may need to be addressed. And I might not be articulating this uh, exactly correctly, but um, a, a pilot explained to me that when pilots have to leave for health reasons, reason is overcome, and then they try to get back into the system, that there's not enough people or that process is also being delayed and has a long lead time. And I think that's particularly problematic given the, you know, chronic shortage of pilots. Is, is, that, is he correct in that? And is there anything you can do about that? He is correct in that. Uh, I've had two flight instructors who both went through that and they both complained to me about how long it took. Uh, so we're trying to move that approach. It's not unrelated to the mental health uh, arc that we've set up. Uh, just trying to make the 